looks like we have the quorum, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Council Member Watkins, if you are back, please turn on your camera and Council Member Golders back. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2.30 session of the January 26, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home today to, to view the city council meeting. All council members are participating, oh, excuse me, if you wish to comment on the agenda today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to speak on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for, the, for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on the item of your, int of, of your interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Council Member Watkins? Is currently not with us right now. Kellen Terry Johnson? Present. Brown? Here. Coming? Here. Boulder? Here. Uh, just to note, Councilmember Watkins is now here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? I'm present. Okay, we will move on to, we have two presentations this afternoon. Uh, our first is the annual Santa Cruz Metro State of the Union. And I believe that Alex is here, Alex Clifford, the Executive Officer of the uh, Metro Santa Cruz is here this evening. Welcome, Alex, thank you for coming. Well, thank you so much, Mayor, I appreciate it. And council members and city manager, I always look forward to my annual State of Metro presentation. Um, obviously today's presentation will be a little different than the past ones because the past year has been a little different than past experiences. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and start my shared screen. I think I'm going to be doing the driving here, as I recall. Okay. And can you see that okay at your end? Yeah, it looks great. It, it's on, Alex. Yeah. Great. And if for some reason it doesn't change slides, please let me know. I had a problem with that earlier uh, this week in another presentation. Um, so that. Did that change this time? Did you yes, see slide it did. Oh, yep. perfect. Then we're, we've got a good thing going on here. All right, so let me just talk a little bit about transit and what we think it might look like, both current and in the future, although the future is real foggy right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, no one really knows exactly what it looks like. We certainly have more questions than answers, and we don't have real good history to draw from. Now, we know that associated with this COVID pandemic, there will be some sort of economic crisis. We're experiencing some of that already, um, but we don't know how long it will last, how long it will take to recover. Um, we have some experience from a prolonged economic downturn, and that was the Great Recession about 2008 to 2014. Um, then there was the swine flu in 2009. That did reach pandemic, but nothing like this, not even comparable. Uh, and then we had, of course, the 2005 avian flu. Um, to the extent that we learned things that we could apply here from, from that experience, um, I will tell you that back in that time frame, 
um, we learned a lot about disinfecting. So we were able to start early planning before COVID arrived in this county based on that experience to start planning for disinfecting products and processes. So what do we want to do? We want to, of course, always do the right thing. You do as a city, we do as Metro. Um, we want to protect our employees and customers. We want to take great care for the public trust, minimize mistakes. Uh, to that end, we have participated in nationwide and California transit agency forums, whether that be webinars, weekly meetings, uh, all sorts of Zoom meetings uh, for, for transit agencies, both in the state through the CTA and through APTA on our national uh, transit association to share information um, when one agency does something that is costly, might be perceived a mistake, we share that information so that nobody else makes that same mistake. When we have success stories, likewise, we share that information. In doing so, we can use the public trust in the way that the public would want us to use it and be very careful in using it. So at Metro's initial, initial strategy, uh, is really sort of three phases. <clears throat> One is to restore public and customer confidence in a safe experience with riding a bus, looking at adding value. How can we, what things can we do to attract people back to the bus? And three is that post-COVID transit service. What does that look like? We're spending a lot of time thinking about that. Is it the same? I don't know. Phase one, restoring public uh, and customer confidence in our safe experience. So sometime back, we joined uh, the APTA Health and Safety Pledge. Uh, on all of our buses, we have this logo, and then in various advertising slots, we have the picture that you see there, which shows what we're doing as an agency and what we expect our customers on the right side of that, what we expect our customers to be doing in order that we both jointly work together to keep the customers and our employees safe. You probably noticed as our buses roll down the street on the sides, maybe some of the backs of the buses, we have these uh, ad spaces that we're filling, deliberately disinfecting, seriously sanitizing, and serious about safety. Again, we're trying to convey a message to our customers that we take this very serious and we're doing everything possible to help them feel safe when they board our bus and ride it to their destination. If you've boarded a bus, you will notice that we have these plastic between seat row barriers, sneeze barriers, if you will. Um, I don't know of anybody else in the nation who has done this. There certainly is no over-the-counter product. We have some very talented people here in our fleet uh, maintenance uh, shop, and they were able to put these together. Every one of these are custom made. No two buses are made alike, unfortunately, and so everyone had to be custom made. And this, what this does is, as you can see, we block off seats to, to try to keep people physical distancing, but we create these sneeze barriers to try to prevent airborne droplets should there be somebody sitting immediately in the seat behind you. And we do capacity constrain our buses. So uh, our 40-foot buses are capacity constrained to 15, and our 35-footers our are capacity constrained to 12. So we've been doing that for quite some time. We're still holding fast at, at those kinds of capacities. And then every night when our bus rolls in to be refueled, um, we go through a process of cleaning and disinfecting. And on the left, you see one of our vehicle service workers with a sort of a backpack device. This is an electrostatic uh, fogger. And that fogger is dispensing disinfectant. And that person will disinfect all the different surfaces, seat, seat backs, stanchions, hands, and straps. And then on the right, you can see when the customer boards the bus, they have the opportunity to, to dispense some hand sanitizer as they board the bus. Every one of our buses have this. And then we sort of took a page out of, out of the rail handbook, if you will. Um, we hired a number of temporary, what we call cleaners, and at all of our transit centers, Watsonville, Capitola, Scotts Valley, and downtown Santa Cruz, we have these cleaners. And what they do is, is when the bus pulls through the terminal, uh, these cleaners quickly jump on the bus. They've, they've got a rag, they've got a bucket of disinfectant, they, they dipped it before they jumped on the bus, and then they 
quickly roll through that bus, hitting all the seat backs and the stanchions and the hand straps, any, any high touch surfaces. What's the, what's the nice thing about this for our service, because it's a linear service across this county and our buses always go through our transit centers, we have the opportunity to disinfect those buses throughout the day. So the bus just doesn't leave in the morning completely disinfected because you know that that can be shortly thereafter meaningless as soon as people start boarding and touching things and spreading germs. So throughout the day, we're constantly disinfecting to help keep uh, those surfaces free from, from uh, uh, COVID. And then for our bus operators, uh, when, uh, when COVID first hit, um, we, we took a step back and we said we got to be really extraordinarily safe. Um, we only let customers board through the back door. We, we discontinued fares until we could put safety measures in place to protect our bus operators from airborne droplets. So this is what we designed and installed on 100% of our buses. It's a clear curtain, much like a shower curtain. And when the bus operator pulls up to the stop, he or she deploys this curtain so that as people board that bus, now they're within six feet of that bus operator, um, their airborne droplets are prevented from getting to that operator. So good protection for our bus operators. And then the county required some time back that everybody waiting at a bus stop, boarding a bus, riding a bus, or driving a bus must wear a face covering. Um, we followed that order. We immediately crafted things like you see here that are on the buses to notify our customers that face coverings are mandatory. And we have empowered our bus operators to refuse rides if people do not have a face covering. Now, um, in one of my prior presentations, it was noted that some people have uh, reactions, allergic reactions, and other reasons why they shouldn't wear a face covering. Um, so we do require those folks to wear a face shield. So the bus operator will, will refuse the ride if they don't have one of those two protective measures. So then we finished this process over several months of, of making our service as safe as we think we possibly can. And in October, we sort of did a relaunch. We said, hey, look at everything that we've done. Come on back. Um, this is a safe service. If your job, if you, you still need to go to your job, your essential job or otherwise, and you're not riding our bus, please come back and ride our bus. And when your job comes back, please come back and ride our bus. So in the, in the area of added value, the big thing today is contactless, touchless, right? We've always had smart cards where people could load fare media or cashing coin on their smart card and they could walk up to the fare box and put it within a couple of inches of the fare box and it would validate it. We've always had that. So since COVID hit, we've been making an extra push to try to get our customers to migrate off of paper and off of cash and coin onto our plastic smart card, go contactless, touchless. In addition to that, in October, we launched our uh, new smartphone application, the Splash Pass. We were originally gonna just pilot that on Highway 17, but because of COVID, we are now piloting, piloting that across the entire system. So people can go online, they can download that app, they can, they can find it on our website, uh, a link to it, download it, load up value and, and they can uh, pay their fare through their smartphone now. We're investigating expanding Wi-Fi to all of our buses. We, we've always had it on our commuter buses that go over the hill on Highway 17. Um, we think it would be added value to consider expanding it to the entire service. And then automatic passenger counters. You know, we're so, in transit, we're sort of data geeks and we don't like to do things anecdotally like this agency has for many years. We like data, we like to drive decisions with data. And so we've always sort of yearned to have APCs, which are passenger counters that we, we would get data, GPS data combined with the APC would tell us how many people board and alight at each bus stop. Now in the COVID environment, coupled with a smartphone application, if we put APCs on our buses, the customer will see how many people are on that bus as it approaches. So we've given the customer, if we do this, we'll have given the customer the opportunity to choose they get to choose whether they want to ride that bus, whether there are too many people on that bus for their comfort level. So we give them the choice. And so we'll bring that to the board sometime this year and hopefully uh, start the process of adding those to our buses. Our bus, the board approved a redesign of our bus stops. They're, they're gonna be smarter looking, nicer looking. We've added these kiosks to our two transit centers, Santa Cruz and Watsonville. They're like the doorbell ring. You customer walks up, 
presses a button, there's a little camera there, and they'll be able to speak directly, or they can, it's already there, speak directly to our customer service reps and have any of their questions answered in real time live. That's important because for the last several months, we closed the customer service uh, window at the two transit centers. So we wanted to keep that close interface with the customer and the, uh, the customer service rep, but also protect both from COVID. And then we are in the process of installing and completing the installation of automatic vehicle location. Um, that will really help us, uh, or help our customers know when the buses are coming. So three, uh, we're evaluating the implementation of on-demand service. Now we took an item to the board this month. Um, we're doing some more work on that and we'll bring it back to the board next month. Um, but that will allow us, if approved by the board, to establish six districts across the entire county in which uh, they, they're all within about three quarter mile of a fixed route in which people can call and have sort of door-to-door Uber-like kind of service. Um, so we hope to launch that next month. And then as, as much as financially feasible, we wanna to try to keep as much service out there as we had pre-COVID. That's important, even though uh, the negative being that we're running oftentimes buses that have few, if any, people on it. We need to keep those buses running because as people come back to work, as they need us for their essential travel, work, doctor's appointment, dentist, grocery store, that bus needs to be there. If that bus isn't there when they come back to use that bus, we risk losing that customer. They may find another way to accomplish their essential need and they may not come back. Um, we did do some surveying of our customers in the post-COVID environment and our customers did say that as they come back, they're looking forward to a little bit more frequency on some of our lines. And then we don't have a real good track record with on-time performance because we operate off of very limited sampling and mostly anecdotal information with the automatic vehicle locators and the APCs I talked about earlier, we'll get better data to plan our service around so that we can make adjustments to the service and help it be much more on time going forward than it is today. We're rethinking the functionality and layout of our transit centers, and we're also rethinking the future of ticket vending machines, paper, fare, media, uh, cash, and coins. And then of course, we really look forward in a couple of years to this bus on shoulder project that's integrated into the RTC's Highway 1 auxiliary lanes. We think that will be of great benefit for moving people kind of in a BRT bus rapid transit fashion between north and south and south and north. Ridership, not such a pretty picture. Um, it plummeted, you can, you can see on the far left of this slide that it, it plummeted back in, in March, um, you know, for example, uh, March 15th, we were at 25,000 rides in a week and we should have been at 102,000. That was year over year comparison. Um, good news is it started to actually climb little by little, far, far from where it should be, but started to climb. And then it, as the county opened up and then when the county started to close back down again, you can see towards the right side of the slide, um, we, we, we decreased in a significant way with the stay home order. Um, as of, I'm looking at just some real current data as of January 16th that week, we were back up to about 15,000 trips, but really year over year, we should have still been at 124,000 trips. So at 80 to 88% down, we have a lot of work to do. And hence the reason that I described earlier about keeping the bus available for when people are ready to return and use it. I'm gonna move on quickly to the state of Metro's budget. As of December 31st, half of our fiscal year ended. Our total revenues, much like you probably saw in the city, were down $1.3 million. The good news is we've been managing our budget with a microscope and we've been able to save money. And so we saved 3.2 million um, through the first half of the year. And that's an overall favorable of 1.8 million. So we're carefully managing the public trust and trying to survive this pandemic. Um, you probably heard about the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, um, passed by Congress, signed by the president, omnibus bill. That simply just means that multiple things are going on. You've got a budget, you've got coronavirus relief, you've got all kinds of things going on in one bill that passes the House, the Senate, and is signed by the president. That's an omnibus bill. 
Um, you have uh, the, in there two things important to us, coronavirus emergency relief and federal budget appropriations. That coronavirus emergency relief has now migrated into something they call CARISA, which is um, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Congress loves to do these things. So in the stimulus part of that, um, we were uh, to receive what we thought when I did this slide is $12 million. That's actually been updated to about $13.5 million. So we got emergency relief funding back in about April, May of last year through the CARES Act of about $20 million, coupled with this $13.5 million. That's really going to help us try to avoid, we're desperately trying to avoid furloughs and layoffs and try to keep as much of that service out there. Congress said when they put these two bills together, they really want us to try hard to keep our bus operators employed. So we're trying, we take that to heart and we're doing our best we can. Um, so what'll happen is as we go through the months to come, fair revenues are still down, sales tax is still down. We'll bridge that monthly deficit with these CARES Acts and these CARISA dollars. And, and the, our greatest hope is that by the time that those reserves are exhausted, hopefully we will have come out of this uh, pandemic economy in a strong way and we'll be back to sort of normal, whatever normal is in the future. Now, if that doesn't pan out, and this is one of those long-term economic downturns, then it's gonna be important that when this is approaching being exhausted, that Congress is con continues to fund future allotments of coronavirus emergency relief for transit agencies. We're all experiencing the same thing across the nation. We need to survive and we may need future help from them. And then in the budget, so the budget's important to us because we have something called transit authorization. It has a clever little name, it's called the FAST Act. It, it, it expired, it was extended for a year, but they had to fund it. So they, they funded it. Um, in there is something called an alternative fuel tax credit. We run compressed natural gas buses, so we get an annual credit through the extender process, and that's, that's $300,000 that we use for capital purchases. And then in our formula programs, the programs that keep us operating, um, they, they did another year, this is uh, the second year of plus ups. So they took the FAST Act minimum authorization funding level and for the second or third year in a row, they said, we're gonna give you the minimum plus some additional amount of money. That is 198 million nationwide. We will, we will benefit to the tune of about 205,000. And then in competitive capital programs, they plus those up 125 million a piece. That's important to us because we've applied for LONO and been awarded a LONO grant in the past for electric buses. And we plan in a couple of years to apply for another one of those for potentially um, hydrogen fuel cell buses. And then this year, just in the matter of a month or two, we're gonna be applying for a bus and bus facilities grant to build our new paratransit facility. So that plus up, will hopefully help us uh, benefit with a grant award here later this year. And then, I, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd just like to close with all Santa Cruz Metro employees, dedicated employees are frontline heroes delivering essential services, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alex, for that presentation. And I would look to the council to see if there are questions from council first. Uh, Renee, uh, excuse me, Council Member Golder. Hi, I don't really have a question, just a comment. I wanna say thank you to Alex and thank you to everyone at the Metro. Um, I know it's been trying times for you um, as bus operators and with ridership down and everything. And I just wanted to mention that my daughter's um, been using the bus for transportation and her favorite Christmas present was her bus pass. And so I would just want to encourage the public that has teenage kids that, um, you know, want to get from place to place, use the bus, it's safe, it's clean, and, um, you know, let's support the Metro. Absolutely, thank you for that. And uh, Council Member Calendari Johnson. Thank you, yes, I also just wanted to thank you for the presentation and all the work that, um, the Metro does, and I look forward to serving on the Metro board. Look forward to working with you. 
Any other council members? If not, I will call on myself. Um, also, just wanted to thank you, um, Alex, for coming today to give us the update. Speaking as a two-year uh, Metro board member, um, I just want our council to know and our community to know that um, it's been a really rough time for, for the Metro. Um, public transit is just an embedded value in the city of Santa Cruz and our community. And I wanna um, especially thank Alex for um, the way that he's led the, the uh, transit district through this emergency. Um, I think of, of, you know, both the um, drivers and the employees of Metro have been amazing through this entire emergency. And so um, they have gone above and beyond. They are incredibly dedicated to the role of public transit in people's lives. And um, it has been a rough year and um, they just, it's been extraordinary to watch how the district has pulled together to really try to continue to do service and also provide safety for, for uh, passengers as, as well as continue um, the various services, including paracruise and other things. So um, it's been extraordinary to watch the district make these transformations <laughs> literally weekly as things have changed with COVID. So Alex, um, just wanna recognize what a rough year it's been and um, just thank you and all your employees and everyone at Metro for keeping, keeping people, you know, at least to the extent that you can, uh, having public transit available for folks. So. And thanks for coming today. I know you're extremely busy, so we always appreciate your annual report. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks so much, Alex. Bye-bye. Okay, next up, uh, we have a presentation on the library mixed use project update. And I have uh, principal management analyst, Amanda Rotella, and. Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb, will be doing the presentation today. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, Council, great to see you again. I am here with an update on the Library Mixed Use Project. Um, we are aspiring to come to you quarterly with some updates to really, as part of our communication plan, to keep you and the public um, in the loop of what's going on. Um, we'll have a presentation from our owner's representative, Griffin Structures. This is the phase one contract um, that you approved last year for the work that they are now doing. And I have John Hughes, who is here with me and is sort of my counterpart at Griffin as we are leading this project forward. And he's gonna share an update on what the work that we've been up to since you last saw us um, and next steps moving forward. And so with that, I'll bring John on and he's gonna share his screen with the presentation. John, are you there? Ah, there you go. I am here. I was trying to get in and it was locked, so thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, uh, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor Bruner and City Council. Uh, my name is John Hughes. I am Executive Vice President of Griffin Structures, and uh, we're very, very honored and pleased to be part of your team to work with Bonnie and Amanda on this exciting project. And so um, we have a presentation for you to kind of give you an update. And like uh, Amanda had said, um, you're gonna be receiving uh, at minimum quarterly updates, um, and uh, this would be constitute the first. So I'm gonna share my screen, and there it is. Okay, can everybody see that? I presume you can. Yes, we can, thank you. So um, this is, like I said, our, sorry, I just can't see myself now. <laughs> okay, here we go. There you are. I see you. You're yeah. Sure. So, uh, like like we said, this is our update uh, for the Downtown Library Mixed Use Project. Some of the things that we're going to be going over quickly is um, we wanted to give you a little introduction to ourselves, our firm, myself, and the different members of our team. Uh, give you a summary of the efforts that we have pursued and completed to date as well as review with you a milestone schedule that shows kind of the, the way we're going to move forward and has within it certain um, items of, of task items that will, be, that will occur in those phases. 
Um, and we've spent a considerable amount of time um, looking at and putting together community outreach tools and plans, communications plans. Uh, so we were looking at that, as well as uh, Amanda will close with an update on the library reuse visioning process update. So a little bit about who we are. Uh, Griffin Structures has been in business serving the public sector for 40 years. Uh, the owner of our company, Roger Torriero, started it in 1990, uh, 91. And um, he was a, originally a developer, but uh, in the 91 recession, converted as a development business into a public sector uh, program and construction management service. Our um, primary scope of responsibility, our primary expertise is in vertical construction. So we do a lot, I'd say 90% of our work is working with cities just like Santa Cruz and um, doing vertical construction projects, buildings essentially. And uh, in that uh, history, we have developed a considerable portfolio overseeing affordable housing projects, libraries, uh, library projects, mixed use development experience and parking structures. Um, so it's a really a great fit for your project because your project is a fusion of all of those. And so we, when we saw this opportunity come, we were very excited to, um, to pursue it and very thrilled to be uh, brought on as part of your team. A little more detail about um, some of our experience. So in that 40 years, we've done f over 400 public sector projects. So that constitutes police stations, fire stations, city halls, uh, community centers, a lot of parks. Uh, we've done uh, 25 affordable housing projects, and those are both um, with uh, public sector and also just nonprofit. So. Um, directly working with uh, firms, many of which um, have worked in the city, like uh, George, um, Bridge Housing, is, for example. Uh, 20 library projects. Libraries are unique projects, and um, we find that many people think they're just buildings with a bunch of books, uh, but in fact, they're incredibly complex, and um, at least, you know, as we've come to realize that it requires a certain level of experience in our team, the team that we dedicated to this project, um, has done a number of projects, library projects, um, just like the one that you're envisioning. 80 design build projects, 40 parking structures, and 50 mixed use development projects. So we have a large portfolio of projects very similar to the downtown library mixed use project. This is our team. So um, I'm up there on the left. Uh, I'm the project executive for this project. I'm also the executive vice president for Griffin Structures. So I oversee the entire portfolio of work that we have uh, under contract. We have about 15 different construction program and construction managers. Um, and for this project, we have a team that's um, centered around Justin Dorico. And Justin is with us today, although with the sea of video faces, I don't know if you can see him or not, but he is <laughs> he's present. Um, Justin just recently completed a project with Group 4 Architecture uh, called the Yorba Linda Library and um, Entertainment Center. It's basically a very large library and a um, uh, community center for plays and performances, a performing arts center. Um, and so, um, Justin's kind of our in-house expert when it comes to libraries. He's done a few of them now, and um, we're really excited to you know, see what he can do with you on your project. He's gonna be leading this project for the entirety of the phase one pro um, aspect, which is, uh, which you'll see later, it gets you through the uh, procurement process, the design pro processing, and right up to construction. Once construction begins, we're gonna um, be bringing on Hernan Muneco, who lives locally in the area, um, and he'll be de deployed full-time on-site to be our on-site construction manager representing the city, being the eyes and ears of the city. Um, and in addition to that, one of the things that we bring to the table that we're really kind of excited to uh, bring to the city is that we have a very robust public outreach staff that, that uh, teaming relationship with Susan Hardin who is part of our team. She's also here today. There she is, at least on my screen, I can see her. And um, we recognize that the city of Santa Cruz um, takes a great interest and uh, places a high priority on informing, communicating, and um, reaching out to the public. 
And so um, as part of our scope and as part of our team, we have a, a public outreach um, team member who's dedicated solely to that. Um, that effort and a uh, specialist that's going to be working with Amanda and Bonnie and your entire um, communication staff to be able to um, keep the community informed. And, and we'll be touching on a few of those uh, tools that we'll be using a little bit later. We also have on this org chart the owner, Roger Torriero. Uh, before uh, starting this company, he spent 20 years in real estate development. And we also have um, Corin Crawford, who's our affordable housing expert, he has a long history of delivering projects, affordable housing projects. And so when a question arises that I can't answer, we ask Corin. And um, so that this is, this is your team. Some of the things that we've done to date. So we started back in December. Uh, we met with Bonnie and um, uh, Amanda and your, uh, the county librarian, uh, the PIO staff, we're still getting familiar with, the, with all the people involved. Um, but we did a, a, we've done a deep dive into your program. What are the, what's the needs assessment? What are, are the requirements of the project? What are the parameters of the project? What are the limits, constraints? What is your, all of the existing documentation that's been performed to date, which you have a lot of. Um, what does it all mean and, and, and help, and that helps us to, um, kind of inform our way forward. Uh, to that end, we, we uh, performed a, um, what we call a deep dive into a delivery analysis. And what we mean by that is um, a form of delivery is, is how do you structure the project contractually? You know, who hires the architect? Who hires the builder? Who hires the developer? How do you carve up the, the, the pieces of this pie? When you have a project like this with multiple stakeholders and multiple components, it can get tricky. And so we um, ran a series of different evaluations and analyses, reviewed them with staff, and um, and and came up um, with a, with some options that were that we're now moving forward with in terms of how to you know progress forward. And 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 we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. We also had Susan and her team work with the city and your team to put together uh, and build out a communications strategy. So talking about um, tools, uh, you know, various methods and means of communication. How often? Um, who are the stakeholders? The, the the constituents that are that are primary and primarily involved. What are their primary concerns? Doing a deep dive into the communication strategy so that we can fulfill the city's um, commitment of a robust strategy. And then with all that, putting together a schedule um, and looking at the schedule. Uh, we even met with. Um, uh, some uh, folks from the uh, from the uh, bonding uh, advisors about when the money is due and when some and some of the milestones related to that, and so we have a schedule that is a high level milestone schedule, and I'll share it with you now. It's still very high level, so this will get broken down in further detail as the prog as the project unfolds. We'll get down to the point where we. Um, start, you know, having very specific delivery dates for different consultants. But at this stage, to give you a, just a high-level view, we've broken the project up into four phases. We right now are in the team building phase. So that involves the solicitation for, well, the, initially the program delivery analysis, which we spoke of earlier, um, the solicitation and selection of the master architect, uh, solicitation and selection of the um, affordable housing developer, and establishing the communication strategy. We hope to have all of that done and um, ready uh, by the end of the second quarter of this year. Once the design team is on board, we anticipate about a year and a half to um, go through schematic design, design development, construction documents, entitlement and permitting, and contractor selection. So that's kind of where we'll be, that's, and, and those two together constitute phase one overall that uh, Amanda spoke of in terms of our, our commitment. And then phase two goes into the construction phase. Right now we're anticipating the construction uh, taking a full two years. Uh, it could be f faster, it, it, but uh, at this point we, we don't wanna overcommit. We wanna, um, we wanna be able to um, meet the requirements that we present. And so given the nature of this project and the tight quarters and the multiple components of the project, um, 
We anticipate it uh, taking that long and, and involving clearing the site, grading and underground utilities, bringing in all of the offsite in, in improvements for water and power and gas and electric and everything. Uh, shell and core construction, so that's just the structure itself, as well as building out the interiors and then all the site work and landscape. And then in the first and second quarter of 2025, we anticipate going through punch list, commissioning, the catalog move. Um, one of the big things with libraries is, is just moving the books in because usually there's a very, uh, a very robust effort that is concurrent with moving. It's not just picking up books and moving them. There's the, the catalog gets revised, it gets enhanced, it gets built out, it, get, it, it, it expands. And so, and maybe certain um, elements of it get um, uh, updated to be able to be more user friendly. So there's a lot to just the catalog move. And that usually happens concurrent with commissioning. So there's a number of testing and um, uh, balancing and different systems that get kind of, you work out the bugs. And then of course, a grand opening, we move in the public. So this is the kind of the, the macro schedule and, and, the, and the high level tasks. And, and like I said earlier, it will get more refined as we build out the project. Some of the, oh, there we go. Some of the things that we have looked at and worked with staff uh, specific to community outreach are these tools. Um, we want to and are, and are anticipating performing each of these in, on some level. And, and we're still working out the timing and the frequency of each, but we're prepared to, do, to, to have community design workshops, stakeholder meet, meetings and presentations, pop-up events, social media posts, project newsletters, e-blasts. Um, we'll be producing a fact sheet. Uh, we're gonna be updating the website content, uh, press releases, updates for officials, updates for you folks. Uh, uh, quarterly updates, I should say, uh, updates for the officials and then quarterly updates for council. And one of the things that we, we really like to do, although it can, it can be somewhat challenging, is we like to recommend and post a 24-hour hotline. Once construction starts, as you guys know, um, that's usually one of the things people that, that, that constituents often just are most inconvenienced by is just construction stuff trucks and cranes and concrete and all the things that might hold things up or inconvenience you or, or you might see something that you have a question about. What we always do is we recommend a, 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 a signage on the, uh, for, like you see on most projects, but it has a phone number. And we would um, have a pre-recorded um, outgoing message that allows anyone at any time to leave a, a voicemail. And our construction manager will monitor that on a daily basis and our commitment is to respond to that voicemail within 24 hours, meeting with staff, meeting with, you know, getting the right answer. We do that primarily because our, uh, based on the 40 years of experience that we've had, uh, we believe that if people are heard, if people just feel like when they call City Hall and there's a, there's a voice there that responds to them, that that, does a, that, that, that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, even if, if there's something going on that construction can, you know, might be noisy or could be con, you know, um, uh, challenging in some way, having that, one, that, that direct line of communication um, goes a long way to demonstrating that the city of Santa Cruz cares about its constituents and is communicating openly with them to the extent possible to, get, um, to deliver this project. So those are some of the tools. Again, this will get fleshed out further. And um, we've even gone through some branding and some coloring. You'll see we have a nice little logo down here that we <laughs> that we created. So, um, uh, the, oh, I, I, I changed it. So that's kind of our uh, outreach and communications tools. So the, for the most part, that is where we are right now on our side. And um, I'll hand it off to Amanda to talk about um, the library reuse visioning. Yes, thank you, John. So this is just a super quick update. Part of the direction that you provided to us was to initiate a community engagement process around uh, reuse of the existing library site um, and with the direction to look at uh, it as an opportunity site for housing, uh, for a downtown commons and other public um, 
public uses. And so we released an RFP um, last year, in the tail end of last year in December. It closed earlier this month, and we received four really strong proposals from reputable firms. And we are in the process of reviewing those. We have a multi-departmental staff that is gonna be working on this team. Primarily, Economic Development will be partnering with Parks and Rec um, to review those proposals and make a final decision later this week. And I'm hoping to launch this process in, um, in February, first thing in February, and it's anticipated to be a three-month process to include community engagement, engagement with stakeholders, and ultimately returning to you for a study session to review all the different options and recommendations. So more to come on that, um, but where there's lots of balls in the air and we're kind of moving things forward on concurrent paths. And with that, um, I'll open it up to any questions. Um, I know we're, we've got only a limited amount of time, so I'll uh, defer to the mayor. Thank you, Amanda and John. Um, I really appreciate you coming, John, to uh, introduce yourself and your firm and everyone that's working on the project. So it's good to uh, great to meet everybody. And yeah, we're running a little bit late, but I'm happy to see we're only about four minutes late. Um, so if there are questions from council or comments, um, maybe with just a few minutes, I'll look to see if any uh, folks have and again, today is really a presentation. This was um, part of our you know, recommendation and motion was that we would get regular updates. So meant to be a presentation. And uh, let's see, um, I will uh, call on Council Member Cummings, Kalantari Johnson, and uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that presentation. Um, I had, I'll keep it pretty brief, um, but I had a couple comments and a couple questions. Um, the one comment I had, I was just wondering if maybe, if they haven't been posted already, if we can post the schedule for when the quarterly updates will occur. That way, if members of the public want to listen in, um, they'll kind of know at least what day um, it's going to be coming on in the future. Um, and then I had two questions. One, I was wondering, you know, I think one of the biggest um, concerns that many members of the public had was around the funding for the affordable housing component. And I'm just wondering when we might hear back about, um, in terms of like the cost of construction and the different components and the different um, areas where funding might come into account and what, where the, that funding might come from. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, I believe we have uh, Bonnie Lipscomb on the line and I'll, I'll defer to her to respond to that question. Great, thanks, thanks Amanda, and uh, good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Our timeline, um, as John showed um, in the schedule, is that we want to get pretty quickly an affordable housing developer on board, and then we'll be meeting with them um, right away to look at um, what grants we're going to apply for, you know, for this project, and that will really set the timeline overall for the budget. Um, so we'll, you know, report back to you um, once we have the affordable housing director and um, developer, and you'll actually, um, we'll have another report to you before that point. So we may actually have some updated information on that. Um, we're also looking at specifically different funding mechanisms. We're looking at a couple of uh, legislative, um, two different efforts, particularly um, one around affordable housing um, to maximize the affordable housing that allows us to move forward pretty expeditiously and makes us very competitive uh, for uh, funding. And then of course we have um, our holding in our um, affordable housing trust fund uh, funding for this project. So we're feeling, you know, we're feeling pretty good about uh, our ability to deliver, I think, on the affordable housing piece. I think what's outstanding is actually the number of units and trying to maximize that within the development footprint. And we'll come back to you, you know, once we have the affordable housing developer on board with some potential options for, you know, meeting sort of the current zoning and height, um, additional height, number of units, that type of thing. So those are the, the, the areas that we still need to work out, um, but we're feeling pretty confident about the funding at this point. Great, thanks. And then I just had one more question, and maybe this could either be for Lee or Tony. Um, you know, having been on council now for a couple years, one of the things that we consistently see is um, that when projects come forward, um, there are occasions when we get sued over uh, uh, for CEQA, potential CEQA violations. And I'm just wondering um, what the approach is for this project so that we can kind of avoid um, 
you know, finding ourselves in a situation where we're pretty far along, but then we end up in a lawsuit that then drags it out for, you know, another few years. So, so I guess, yeah, what are some of the um, thoughts or mechanisms that um, we can, the steps we can take now to make sure that we don't find ourselves in that kind of a situation down the road? Um, well, <laughs> um, you know, we can't completely uh, insulate the city from a from a CEQA litigation, but I envision this project will definitely require an environmental impact report. And, um, and, and in most of the cases in which we've been sued under CEQA in the past, we've used a negative declaration. And the standard for a negative declaration is much different than from an environmental impact report. And so long as the city makes the necessary findings and um, and that there is substantial evidence in the record to support the findings and, and the council's conclusions with respect to environmental impacts associated with the project, um, it, it should be theoretically defensible. Um, CEQA litigation, as you know, is complicated and um, you know the outcome can't be predicted with certainty, but we certainly have to make sure that we dot all of our I's and cross all of our T's as we go through that CEQA uh, process. Thank you. And next I'll call on Council Member Colin Tart Johnson. Thank you, and thanks so much for that presentation. Um, I just have one question. It was great to see the outline and bullet points of a robust communication plan and outreach strategy. I was wondering if at a future um, presentation and update, if you can share your specific strategies on how to engage um, some of the harder reach populations for the design, um, specifically of the library, but the whole project, um, in particular Spanish speaking populations, uh, youth and seniors. So thank you so much. Thank you, and I'll just make just a quick comment on that. Um, you know, we'll be working very closely with our architect design team to, to develop that plan, so absolutely more to come. Great. And Council Member Brown. I think that Council Member Cummings and Calentari Johnson asked the key, the main questions that I uh, was wondering about, so thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, everybody for uh, pulling a, an update together for us. I guess uh, just to follow up on the questions around outreach and engagement, a lot of the, and I appreciate seeing you know, all of the different mechanisms that you, you're thinking about, um, but many of the elements do seem to be more um, in terms of the outward facing uh, uh, approach to be more about a transfer of information to the public about what's going on. And so I definitely am interested in learning more about, uh, you know, what, what your plans are for engagement, uh, you know, in particular um, of, you know, populations that are underrepresented um, in many ways and certainly underrepresented in terms of their uh, uh, interaction and kind of voice uh, at the city. Absolutely. Thank you so much for those comments. And um, yeah, I agree. And I think a big part is we want to be very intentional about expectations that we set. And so want to want to be fully prepared when we come forward with that information, knowing that we're setting those expectations with the community. So we're 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 working on that. And as I um, said, we're going to bring on that design team and figure out how to really integrate into their process a community engagement plan. Um, and so absolutely, once we've got them on board, we'll have some key markers about when the community will be engaged. You know, we've, we've had some discussions about listening tours, you know, really opportunities where there is communication coming in and we are taking in input from the community and hearing concerns. Um, so thank you for those comments. Okay. Any other comments from council members? I'm not seeing any. Um, Amanda and Bonnie and the team, um, Slate, thank you very much for being with us today and we appreciate the presentation and we look forward to more in, uh, in the next few months. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, John. Okay. Okay. I have a few announcements and then we're gonna move on to um, the next uh, parts of our meeting here. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. 
If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be opened for public comment during today's meeting are numbers nine through 31 on our agenda today. Move on to statement of disqualifications. I'd like to ask uh, council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, we will bring, uh, we will move on to additions and deletions. I'd like to ask the city clerk administrator to announce any additions or and deletions to the uh, agenda today. There are none today. Next, um, I would like to make an oral communications announcement. announcement. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item 31 today. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item 31. I'd like to next call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. Uh, the council met uh, remotely via Zoom this afternoon, beginning at one o'clock uh, to discuss the following items. The first was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, uh, specifically the claim of Sally A. Whitman. Um, that item is also listed as number 13 on your consent agenda this afternoon. Uh, the second item was uh, existing litigation. There were two cases discussed in closed session uh, this afternoon. The first, the case Santa Cruz Homeless Union et al. versus the city of Santa Cruz pending in the United States District Court. The second, don't morph the wharf et al. versus the city of Santa Cruz uh, et al. And that is pending in the uh, Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Lastly, there was one item of potential litigation, specifically significant exposure to litigation. And um, on uh, those items, there was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. I'd like to now call on the city manager for his report uh, to and, and updates on the city's business, COVID-19 response and events. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon. Just going to provide uh, four items uh, very briefly to update you on. Uh, they are just a quick update on the Highway 1 and 9 encampment, uh, generally on the COVID um, and where we are with respect to the uh, state uh, uh, the status of the uh, uh, shelter in place order. Uh, a quick status on the eviction moratoriums uh, and information on that. And then uh, just very briefly, just touch upon weather. I'll start with uh, just the weather. I think everybody knows that uh, we have a um, pending um, large amount of rain and, and wind that's uh, starting uh, already in, uh, in the next few days. Uh, and that requires, uh, uh, well, first of all, with respect to the impact to the city, we're not anticipating major impact directly to the city. Um, although there is an impact that's uh, uh, expected in the county, and so the county has uh, issued a evacuation warning in the San Lorenzo Valley and other areas, particularly those that were in the uh, in the fire uh, debris zones. Uh, however, we are planning uh, and prepared to assist if needed and or to uh, respond if needed to activate our emergency operations centers needed. We've also done a lot of work to prepare our public works crews and maintenance crews have cleared out storm drains and uh, we're also uh, going through the uh, river levy and uh, uh, informing individuals that uh, uh, they need to move and referring them to services uh, where we can uh, so that uh, people don't find themselves in, in a situation of a uh, uh, dangerous situation. Uh, so we're, we're actively preparing on that. And again, uh, the, also the Red Cross is establishing some uh, uh, evacuation sites for those in the evacuation zones, which are, as I said earlier, uh, primarily in the San Lorenzo Valley and not in the city of Santa Cruz, but we're prepared to assist and, and respond accordingly. Um, I'll move on to uh, 
COVID really quickly. So the governor just uh, very recently announced a, a change in the, uh, uh, essentially in, in the COVID-19 status for the state of California, essentially removing the statewide uh, 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 shelter and order and moving us to back to the, the model that we had before with the various colored tiers. So for the county of Santa Cruz, what that means is that we're in the purple tier, and this was effective uh, yesterday. Um, and specifically what that means for most people is that they would wanna know is that uh, restaurants are now, can now back, be open back up uh, outdoors only. Uh, retail, the capacity has increased indoors to 25%. Hair salons, spas, and barber shops are also now open again with restrictions. The bars are closed but can be open uh, if, if they're serving food. And then fitness clubs can reopen outside only and uh, no indoor gatherings continue to be uh, restricted uh, or in place. So those are the, the major changes. So uh, some restrictions are going away. And also our, um, our case counts are down. Uh, they went down from 79 to 41 uh, per thousand. Uh, so that's a, that's a good sign and the IC capacity has gone up as well. Uh, the other area of much discussion and uh, interest, of course, is uh, the vaccines. Uh, and that's an area where it's been um, a bit of a challenge to get clarity on that. And the rollout has been a challenge uh, from the state level to the, I mean, from the federal level to the state level. Uh, a big part of that is uh, that uh, just the supply is just not uh, sufficient, really. And uh, again, uh, the way it's been rolled out has been a bit confusing and there's been changes. But what I would do is, um, and I'm gonna share my screen here really quickly, it's just uh, to uh, direct people to a couple of websites where I think they can get the most accurate information about that. And, uh, and the first one is, uh, it's called, uh, uh, can, you, can you see my screen? It's the vaccinateca.com, Vaccinate California, abbreviated vaccinateca.com. This is a very helpful website, believe it or not, uh, that has been developed by volunteers primarily, but you can put in your zip code, you can look up your county, and you can find out where you can get vaccinated or, or if you qualify and what the criteria is. Also, the other website that you can go to is, uh, let's see if I can get it here. Uh, the county website, here it is, on, uh, and this is the County Health Services Agency COVID-19 vaccine website. You just Google Santa Cruz County uh, vac vaccination. It'll give you a link to this. And this also has information around the various tiers as, as far as who's eligible, as well as information about how to uh, find out where you can get vaccinated. Uh, and it's all laid out here specifically within our county. So this is really good information. So I would direct people to these two websites that they wanna get more informed about uh, getting vaccinated. And then what I'll do now is quickly turn it over to uh, Lee Butler to just give, a, give an update on the Highway 1 and 9 encampment. And then after that, I'll have um, Bonnie Lipscomb just give an update on the eviction moratoriums very briefly. Thanks, Martini. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'd like to first, before jumping into Highway 1 and 9, um, give one quick storm update um, to supplement what Martine said. We've had crews from police, public works, fire, water, and the parks department out um, moving or uh, encouraging people to move from the uh, areas that look to, uh, that have potential for flooding. And we believe that everyone is out of harm's way right now along San Lorenzo. And the update that I wanted to provide really was that um, Public Works has sent in crews behind um, the campers who have moved and they've cleared truckloads, large, multiple large truckloads of trash today. They, as of just before this meeting, they were bringing a skid steer out to um, get additional trash out of there. You know, uh, everyone has seen, um, you know, some of the, the conditions. And so um, we just wanna let you all know that we're, we're looking to address both the um, health and safety components as well as the um, environmental quality aspects of the encampments that have popped up there. So jumping over to um, Highway 1 and 9, um, Public Works has placed a series of 96 gallon cans along the 
highway there, and they are um, checking those on a daily basis. They're emptying them multiple times per week. We're also coordinating with Caltrans and the California Highway Patrol to do um, the place to do shoulder closures uh, coupled with the placement of dumpsters out there. Um, so we've had that done previously and the next one we're trying to schedule for early in February. We're also looking to do that on a bi-weekly basis because we're seeing that there are large items that are accumulating and even with the uh, with, with many 96 gallon bins out there, we need that additional trash service. So we are um, uh, working with our partners on that. Um, the county is assisting with that in terms of outreach to the community and that's there and encouraging them to um, place their, their trash in the receptacles. And they're also out there doing regular outreach, um, health related and housing related. Um, we do have the Highway 1 and 9 widening project that is planned to begin in early spring. And that um, will require that campers move and relocate before um, that can commence. So we are in communications with Caltrans regarding that. The biggest challenge that we have right now is that we really don't have a place to send folks. We don't have a definitive place where we can say, here is where you can go um, after you leave this location. So we do have um, an inquiry in Caltrans about whether or not they can assist us with um, any state lands and we'll continue to look locally and partner with the county as well to see um, what options we can identify. Thank you, Lee. Um, then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Bonnie and then after we're all done, we're, we're happy to answer any questions you have on any of these items as well. So go ahead, Bonnie. Great, thanks, Martine. Um, and I just wanted to add, um, related to the, the storm event, um, that we've also been working um, with our fire department, who's been facilitating with us with CAL FIRE and our city attorney's office on um, an emergency agreement for CAL FIRE crews to mobilize our Sky Park site for any rescue crews needed. So just wanted you to be aware of that as well. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to give a brief update on um, eviction protections, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. A lot has happened just since yesterday, um, so um, it's, it's um, pretty exciting. And can you all see that? Make sure I'm showing the right thing. Um, so uh, specifically, there are, we, we originally were tracking on a couple of bills um, by two, 15 and 16, um, but we're now actually, just because we're really nearing the end, which was January 31st, of extending uh, the moratorium on evictions, um, the legislature switched to a couple of trailer bills and, um, I'm having trouble moving, there we go, a couple of trailer bills, um, budget trailer bills. So we have four that we're tracking on, two in the Assembly, two in the Senate. Um, AB 7980, 8991. I'm just going to sort of reference 80 going forward, but they're all, one is a budget appropriation that actually takes the funding, the, the 25 million, which California share is actually 10% of the nation's share um, for renter uh, relief funding um, and appropriates that through the legislature. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then the other bill, the second bill, is establishing a renter relief program. And I'll go into a little uh, more detail on that as we know it today. Actually, as, as uh, we're having our meeting, um, the legislature is having a budget hearing right now on 79 and 80, and they are discussing this. They do need to vote this um, in, by Thursday, so we are expecting um, some, you know, some potential changes, but this is uh, I'll give you sort of an overview of what's in uh, the proposed bill language now. Um, and just to clarify, this is an extension of the existing bill, which is the Tenant Relief Act of 2020, um, better known as AB 3088, um, that was uh, set to expire on January 31st. So the latest bills that are being um, discussed today on the floor um, would extend that through June 30th. There is support um, both, um, in, the, in the Assembly and the Senate and uh, for, by the governor. So it is anticipated this will go forward and extends that an additional five months through June 30th, 2021. It's important to note this is for residential tenants only. We currently do have the moratorium on commercial evictions through March 31st. Um, I'll mention that in a few minutes. Um, so no tenants, the basis um, of under 388, 
3088 is that no tenant with COVID-19 related hardships may be evicted prior to June 30th if they pay at least 25% of the rent due from March 2020 through June 30th, 2021, with the key being um, by the time this funding can, will be released, likely sometime in March would be the be beginning of it, that um, it's sort of through March is the uh, funding or the rent in arrears. And then there is actually some prospective payments that tenants would be eligible for from March till June. Um, and there are also some additional protections in there, anti-foreclosure protections for small landlords as well. Um, the other exciting element of this is it also contains a $2.6 billion, this is our California share, appropriation of federal rent relief funds. And $1.1 billion of that is going to go directly to local jurisdictions, $200,000 and above. So our county is eligible to receive a share of this funding. Um, and then additionally, uh, the bill includes some statutory changes to implement a state-run $1.5 billion rental assistance program. And this is for all eligible recipients as part of the 2020 Budget Act. So it's through their budget trailer bills that they're making this possible this week um, in that sort of urgency mode. Um, the county does actually have an option of accepting the funds or declining them. And if they decline them, it just means that the state uh, will actually administer uh, the, the program on behalf of the county. So um, HCD uh, is supposed to allocate these funds by February 19th. Uh, by the current bill language, 65% of those funds must be obligated by June 2nd of this year, 100% by August of this year. And as I mentioned earlier, if the county elects not to receive the funding, HCD will contract with a vendor to implement the program on behalf of the state in our county. We're not eligible because of the size of our city to receive it directly, but our renters will be the recipients of the funding, um, either through the county or through the vendor that's implementing the program on behalf of the state. Uh, targets for the program round, run, round one, the first is targeting assistance for eligible households under 50% of area median income. Round two will be um, disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 as determined by HCD. We're waiting to hear a little more detail um, on that. And then round three will be eligible households not otherwise prioritized um, under 80% AMI. And then with funds remaining and they are anticipating from the federal government additional round of stimulus that would supplement um, this rental relief program um, for those up to potentially 130% of area median income. Um, eligible uses, as I mentioned, rental arrears, um, through the program that they're establishing, that'll be limited to 80% of uh, back rent due. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. That's for participating landlords. So um, prospective uh, rent payments as well would be eligible. And that means from March, you know, assuming they get the first round in March, from March through the end of June, the end of June would be um, and not to exceed 25% of the monthly rent due. And that's an important percentage, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, can also be used for utilities, back utilities, utilities in arrears, and then other expenses related to housing authorized by federal law. Um, there's two options. There can be a landlord participation where the funding goes directly to the landlord. Um, the landlord must agree to forgive remaining debt owed and release any and all claims for non-payment for that specified time period through the end of June, which is great. So a landlord has the ability to get 80% of all back rent and prospective rent through the end of the current period by the end of, end of June um, if they opt to participate in this program. And then the tenant is relieved from any sort of legal um, liability, which is great. The other option is the landlord decides not to participate, then the tenant can apply directly for funding and they will get up to a maximum of 25% owed for that specified time period. And that's so right now we're just talking about the back rent owed. Um, so April through when they anticipate the funding to come out. And why that's key is because uh, under th uh, 3088, a uh, tenant only had to pay up to 25% of back rent owed to not be evicted. So that's what this amount is capped at, is that 25% to make them eligible through the existing uh, law and the extension of it um, through the end of the period, the end of June. Um, other provisions that are very helpful, it exempts from income, this, this uh, 
revenue that would be received, rent relief for tax purposes, and also eligibility um, for taxable years before January 2025. Um, so tenant income will not um, be considered gross income, which is very helpful. It also imposes a moratorium on actions seeking to recover rental debt until July, uh, July 1st, 2021. And it prohibits discrimination by a housing provider of any tenants uh, who um, may not have paid uh, their rental debt as they're seeking new housing, um, that you cannot discriminate, discriminate against them if they have not paid, um, if they have outstanding rental debt. Um, I wanted to just point you to a resource by, uh, by, the, by, our, by our California government. It's actually, the site is housingiskey.com. And what's on it, as you can see, is there's resources um, for tenants, landlords, homeowners, and community partners with forms, um, as well as information, which will be, as soon as this um, is, is uh, passed into law, updated information on the enacted um, and actual details of the bills I'm going over today. Um, we had some questions about the federal versus state protection. Um, there is a Center of Disease um, Control order, a CDC order that's in effect until March 2021, but it's actually less protective than California. California has the most protective tenant relief and tenant projections around evictions in the country right now, and that certainly would be continued um, with this legislation if that's enacted into law. Um, and um, through the federal, additional federal protections, there's some national mortgage settlement and tenant legal defense um, investment um, nationally and some for, uh, strengthened foreclosure protection. And then finally, I was asked a little bit, and this is, and uh, the city attorney can jump in here if you have specific questions on this, but um, our council in June did adopt the emergency ordinance extending the moratorium for commercial evictions um, through August 13th or for so long as authorized by the governor. And the governor did issue executive order N8020, which extended the local ability um, for extending commercial evictions through March 31st. So we do currently have protections for commercial evictions through March. And with that, um, there's, this information will be available on our website, also on our housing resources page, and we'll put some information also in our weekly update to council. And I'm happy to answer any related questions. Thank you, Bonnie. Martin, is that, um, do you have additional um, comments, Martin? Uh, no, that concludes our, our reports and we're happy to answer any questions on, I know there's a wide range of topics and what we went back, but happy to answer questions. I think there's a lot going on, so I really appreciate, um, you know, there's a lot of things that council members were trying to track and so um, I kind of loaded you guys up with a, a, a large variety of projects, but it's, um, it's a great way to just get information out to our community and um, kind of provide that brief update um, that some people are seeking. So I saw uh, Council Member Cummings' hand go up and also Council Member Brown. Thanks for that update and those presentations, and it's good to hear that we're trying to get um, residents who are camping and sleeping down by the river out of harm's way before. Uh, what could be a really major storm hits our community. Um, I did have a couple questions real quick regarding the um, some of the information on eviction protections. Um, it's really good to hear the state stepping up and that California has some of the uh, best protections in the country. One of the questions I had, I was wondering um, two things. Is there any way or is this information available in Spanish? Because I know that there were a lot of um, Spanish-speaking residents last year who were, um, you know, they were reaching out to the city concerned with being evicted and you know what might be available for them. So I'm wondering if we can maybe get this information in Spanish and try to reach out to some of those groups and organizations. And then um, I was curious, you know, when they say a household has to earn under a certain percentage of AMI, I'm wondering how do they define that? Because, um, for example, if there are four individuals who are independently renting a room and a house, are their combined incomes considered? Um, the household income or is it each individual and does that depend on whether they have independent leases or they're all under one lease? I'm just trying to get a sense of how that kind of works. Um, Council member Cummings, those are very good questions. I'm sort of thinking through through that. Um, you know, typically it's similar to how we do our calculations um, on AMI, but there is that extra complication if there are multiple tenants um, sharing um, sharing a space. So 
we don't have that level of detail in the bill right now. Um, so I think a lot of those questions are going to be um, part of some facts that the state is going to have to roll out with the program. So we're tracking that really closely. Um, we'll get um, any fact sheets that we're developing or that the state is, um, I'm sure they'll be in Spanish, but for our local information, we can make sure that we, um, we work with our city's translator to make sure that that's available. Great, thanks. Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Bruner. Thank you. Um, wow, it's uh, really appreciate the updates, and it's just amazing to think about all of the work that's happening with at the city. Um, and a big shout out to our uh, city workers who are out there uh, trying to make sure that uh, things are uh, we're prepared and um, able to you know uh, potentially activate emergency response if necessary um, I my question is about the eviction more about the rental assistance portion I'm so glad to hear that uh, things have moved at the state they really kept us waiting until the 11th hour um, but I so I'm I'm just wondering I know that in uh, in general when we get formulaic uh, allocations for you know various types of funding from the federal and state governments that we are at a disadvantage being uh, considered a rural county and um, so just and then you know recently news about uh, you know the governor uh, kind of acknowledging having to acknowledge that a significant portion of CARES Act funding was going was being directed to big cities and so and so you know so that and we know that and we've been hearing this for a while now that we're, um, you know, our, we, our allocations are lower. I'm just wondering if they, if there's any clarity on, um, so we're eligible, but is there any clarity on how, is, is it gonna be per capita across the qualifying uh, communities so that we actually are receiving uh, funding kind of at a level that is comparable to other areas? Yeah, Council Member Brown, that's my understanding. Um, although I do think we are at a disadvantage because we're, you know, a county, um, you know, just barely over the, the threshold. Um, so as they roll out the program, you know, larger cities, those that are over 200,000 or 500,000 do get that allocation, but they have that option of running the program themselves. Most of them have the capability to do so. Um, so I think the details when they come out um, will be really interesting. The breakdown of that 2.6 million is 1.5 million is being um, kept by the state to administer um, for all those jurisdictions that are under that 200,000 threshold. And so as a city, if we were a city that had 200,000, we'd be eligible as well. And we'd have that option of getting directly a block grant, which is in effect what all of those jurisdictions or localities that are 200,000 or above. So the county has that option, our county has that option of accepting a block grant, but what comes with it is that obligation to administer the whole program. So I think they're gonna to need to weigh whether or not they can do that. And if they, they don't, that, that funding will still come through. It will just be administered by a contractor or a vendor um, on behalf of the state. So the details of how that works in a county like ours, um, it, I think is yet to be determined. But we're uh, you know, tracking on it closely and uh, you know, obviously advocating um, for our community. Great, thank you. And, and I'm not sure if uh, uh, the community action board directors would, uh, or all the other directors would agree, but uh, you know, if, if we can, if that is the direction that uh, Santa Cruz County goes, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, having that you know, infrastructure set up that um, they might be considered a vendor. Should they want to do it? Actually, you just uh, made me remember something that I, I meant to share. Uh, we just found out that um, we have some available funding um, that is related to a project that wasn't expended for relocation payments, and we are talking with HCD about being able to administer that funding potentially with CAB to extend um, the uh, their our rental assistance program, and it's fairly substantial. It's 300. I think it's like 335, 350,000 in that range, um, and that would be uh, within the city. So we're we're working on that. Yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Um, it was a, we weren't expecting this, so um, this is in addition to uh, the additional funding that you actually allocated um, under COVID for uh, CAB this year. So we're pretty excited. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, council member. Uh, and I have council member Bruner's hands, or I'm sorry, vice mayor Bruner's hands. Thank you. Um, uh, I thank you, Bonnie Lipscomb. And uh, my question actually is for you as well. And uh, I think uh, council member Cummings touched on this as well, but I've been speaking with uh, one of our Spanish speaking community members and um, they are volunteering with a lot of our uh, residents in Beach Flats area and Live Oak. And um, so having the information in Spanish and I know the Housing is Key website on the California site that you gave that um, they have right at the top to your language is that so I haven't gone to choose Santa Cruz and paid attention to that. Is that something we have or um, do you just uh, have it translated and put it out? We have it, we have it translated and put it out. Um, one of the okay. things that, that we have been doing um, since the pandemic that's actually I've been one of those you know positive uh, things coming out of the pandemic is the coordination across the county, and so working with mm -hmm. um, you know different communities and through the community foundation, actually the city of Watsonville. Um, right now, we're working on a business survey, and the city of Watsonville is translating it for us. So it's Great. you know the collaborations have been really helpful, and I think we'll be doing more of that going forward. And Vice Mayor Bruner, I would also just note that we do have the translate button on our main website. Um, so any pages you can translate into Spanish. It's just the, the Google Translate option. Okay. And um, I, I suppose we'll receive further updates, but my question also related to multiple families um, in one, one location or in the case of housemates and how that works. Yeah, and I, and I just don't have more information yet. Yeah. They don't have that level of detail in the bill language that I, and I, I did you know, look at all four bills, but that is there yet. I think that the state, as they pull the program together, are gonna to address some of those details and we'll be giving um, direction to the localities for implementation. Wonderful, thank you. Great. <clears throat> Okay, it looks like that is the question. Uh, again, I just wanna thank, um, express my thanks to our staff um, is going uh, above and beyond these days, trying to manage all these um, natural, uh, natural emergencies, um, tracking legislation to make sure that people are protected from eviction. Um, and I just uh, really appreciate they are taking the time out of their already very, very busy um, work days to, to prepare these things for us so that hopefully when people watch us on TV, they can learn about what's happening. Um, and for any folks who are here from our local press, you know, making sure that, you know, you under, you're able to understand and convey to you through the press, you know, the kinds of things that the city are working on regarding some of these things that we do get a lot of questions on from our community. So um, thank you again, Martine, for that. I really appreciate you um, taking the, uh, <laughs> The mixed uh, mixed bag I threw at you in this those last two days and getting that information out um, very uh, timely for us. Um, no our next item is going to be the council meeting calendar, and in this item, the council will review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda and revise it as necessary. Um, I'll call now on the clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. We have no updates to the calendar. Okay, great. Um, the next item is council membership in city groups and outside agencies. Um, and for those of you who were recently sat, there is a list of those uh, groups and agencies in your packet. Some of you may not have attended a meeting yet, but this is a standing item that we try to have at least every other month. Um, and this is really the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authorities meetings. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. So again, this is uh, if you've attended any of those meetings um, on commissions or outside um, boards that, that uh, you represent the city as a, a council member on, 
uh, and uh, I will open it up to any council members who have uh, any reports to provide. And I'll look for hands raised. Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. So um, on January 13th, we had uh, our AMBAG meeting. Um, one announcement at the beginning was around Central Coast Community Power. One of the things that was mentioned was that um, there is assistance uh, that they're providing for people whose homes were lost during uh, the CZ fires and who would like to rebuild homes that are completely electric. So it would be worth checking out their website for more information for people who would like to um, know what kind of assistance is available for rebuilding um, completely electric homes. Um, we had an update on the Central Coast Coalition's business plan, and this is around Highway 1 um, improvements over time. They're working on um, a plan that's modeled after the State 99 business plan, uh, and the charter of which can be found on their website. Uh, the business plan builds on existing builders, build the business and corridor plans with the goals of safety and health, sustainability and climate change, economy, mobility, and equity, and rail is um, one of the modes of transportation that's going to be included as part of this plan. Um, in addition to an update from LAFCO, or from AMBAG, uh, we all, I also attended the LAFCO meeting. Um, during that meeting, we considered and passed a resolution of appreciation for Commissioner John Leopold's distinguished public service and leadership for his 11 years serving on uh, the LAFCO board. Um, I was uh, elected to become chair around, uh, along with uh, Rachel Lather, who's become the vice chair of the commission. And um, we also discussed the outline for the fire protection and service fear review plan um, that's going to be upcoming. And aside from that, um, the Public Safety Committee, we're trying to put together our schedule right now for when we'll be meeting this year. And the um, Climate Action Task Force actually had a conflict with our meeting today. So hopefully we can get an update uh, from Tiffany or someone uh, for our next meeting. And that's all I have to, that's all I have uh, today. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Thanks. Uh, so just a couple of updates. The Regional Transportation Commission had uh, a public hearing on the uh, transit corridor, corridor alternative analysis, and we um, had robust uh, input from the public about uh, the plans for the future of our rail uh, trail. And so the, we will be making some decisions on at our next meeting on the 6th, I believe is the first, Febu first Thursday in February. And um, so folks, you know, you, if you want to tune in and see where we're at, uh, that would be the time we are. We close the public hearing, but if folks have not spoken um, up, then I believe you'll have an opportunity to do so. Uh, the uh, also the the we're on uh, Mayor Myers and Councilmember Cummings and myself are on uh, the UCSC growth uh, task force that was established by the city and county, and um, we. So I just wanted to alert folks to uh, the website that is. Has been established and it's it's up. It has amazing information about how to get involved. Um, the draft, the UCSC's draft um, EIR for the Long Range Development Plan has been released, and um, there we're at, we're trying to encourage folks to uh, comment. If you go to the website actonucscgrowth.org all one word, act on UCSCgrowth.org. Um, there you can find toolkits and amazing information and also links to sign up if you want to be involved in a draft EIR working group around climate, sustainability, water. There, you know, there's a whole bunch of options. Um, and so really encourage people to get involved. It's, um, it's challenging. It's not a very, um, you know, it's, it's super complex and, um, you know, it's not uh, necessarily an exciting task to review EIRs and uh, provide provide comments, but uh, we're trying to make it as uh, user-friendly as possible to participate, uh, and hopefully you will join us, those who are interested. Great. Thank you, Council Member Brown. 
Uh, any other council members with updates on board commissions, JPAs that they are members of? I'm not seeing any. I know it's the beginning of the calendar year, so a lot of these uh, committees um, are, are just getting up and running again in terms of meetings. Um, I, um, just for the public, I am a member of the board of the, of the board of directors of, the, of Metro um, Santa Cruz, and I'm, I, I think that our uh, our um, executive officer um, CEO did a great job today, so I'm not going to uh, repeat any of those items. Um, so with that, we will move on to our next um, item, and this will be. Our consent agenda beginning with and consisting of grab my script here. And these are items nine through eighteen on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items nine through eighteen. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device. Press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull any items? Council member Brown. Uh, yeah, I'd like to pull item 10, please. Okay. Any other council members wishing to pull any items? I am seeing, oh, council member Cummings. I just had a question on item number 16. Okay. okay. And Bonnie, I'm gonna look for your guidance. Um, do we typically, um, do I wanna go out to public comment right now or do I want to um, have the question for our council member coming to address for item 16? I think you've typically done the questions first and then went to public comment. That's what I recall, thank you. Uh, council member uh, Cummings, um, go ahead and uh, address staff on item 16, please. Thanks, I just had a question regarding um, what kind of opportunities might be available um, to secure funding for the next for this next segment? Um, because it sounds like we don't have enough money to move forward um, with construction, um, but we're um, you know we're it, it sounds like we're we're going out for bids on this project. So I'm just trying to get a sense of um, kind of what. Are there any grants out there currently that we might be eligible for? And if so, kind of what work is being done on securing funding for that next phase? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. Um, we have a grant um, already submitted and we'll hear back uh, mid-February, beginning of March, uh, to see if we received it for the project for construction. And uh, there's another opportunity coming up in April uh, to apply for a grant if we don't get the one that we've already applied for. Um, and then there's, you know, the possibility of stimulus funding and this project would be shovel ready. And so we wanna make sure we're ready to go out to bid. Even though we're getting authorization, we won't actually bid the project until we have the money. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. If there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of items pulled by council members, that's item 10 today, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Look to the... Uh, Bonnie, do you see anyone? Do you see I do, anyone? yeah, there's. Okay. So um, the caller with the last three, four digits of your phone is 2316. You'll be notified that you can uh, speak. 
hello, uh, this is Peter Bichy. How you doing all? Uh, and here your uh, liaison with the city of Santa, Santa Cruz, the community liaison. I just had a question. I've had several members from Beach Flat who have uh, told me, or I don't know if it's a rumor, and that's part of my job, is trying to clarify these rumors and listening the um, um, the status of the metro and the buses before with the CEO, Alex Clifford. Uh, my question is, uh, the rumor is, is that there were at least a dozen drivers who tested positive. Um, and is, are those rumors and, um, and, or is that really have, have been happening and what's their status? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I might suggest, Peter, that we um, help you find an answer for that um, outside of this uh, ex uh, agenda item. This is uh, items on our consent, consent agenda, but um, I know um, Martine Bernal, I'm sure, would be happy to try to help um, contact Alex Clifford to provide yeah, we'll connect. We'll connect. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Seeing that there was no member of the public that has uh, pulled an item, I will go ahead and uh, look for a motion um, on the remaining, excuse me, I'm sorry, we're gonna uh, move to item number 10 now. Council Member Brown has pulled that item. So, I, thanks. Uh, I, I think we, we would uh, approve the rest of the consent agenda yeah. first. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm still in my, I'm still in training wheels here. Fine. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and make that motion that we approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 10. I'll second that. Okay. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Who was the second? Watkins? Watkins, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. And that motion passes unanimously. Okay. We will now come back to item number 10. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I have uh, pulled this item uh, for uh, several reasons, uh, but I want to start with uh, asking questions and to see if there are members of the public who do want to uh, speak up and or ask if you have questions, I can uh, try to ask those as a follow-up. Um, I don't know that that will happen, but uh, just in case. Um, so I've been getting questions for a while now about why we continue to extend the um, authority and and I understand that we are we continue to be in a public health crisis um, and there is an emergency declaration on the books but um, given that the the statute that's cited uh, for um, you know setting emergency conditions is sudden and unexpected and you know it it, we that was true uh, early on, and I think it was you know important that we uh, you know maintained that uh, level of authority so we could be nimble given the um, you know significant crises that uh, our community has faced that we've all faced. Um, but I'm just wondering now that um, you know that we're not really in an unexpected mode with respect to the the COVID pandemic. I mean we're in a um, a place where we don't. Um, we don't know what's to come, but in terms of sudden and unexpected, we're kind of past that phase. So if you could help me understand that. Yeah, great question. Um, the statute specifically authorizes, or first of all, it restricts the duration of an emergency declaration to 60 days. But it authorizes the declaration to be extended uh, if the emergency conditions still persist. And so I, while I would agree that the onset of the COVID emergency um, uh, was sudden and that that's, you know, what the statute is designed to uh, deal with, um, the conditions haven't abated. And so from my perspective, it's a simple, you know, interpretation of the statutory authorization, which says that, you know, if you uh, renew the declaration within a 60 day period, then it's extended 60 days further. Thanks. Uh, if 
I just defer to if there are questions from the public and then I have a, several comments before we vote. I just want to see if there's, um, I have a, a council member Cummings hand is up. Thank you, Mayor. I also had a question too because um, my understanding is that, um, for example, because we're in a state of emergency, that also makes us eligible for emergency funds that we might be able to be eligible for at the state or federal level that we could use to kind of mitigate and offset the emergency conditions we're under. Is that a correct statement? Yes. Um, I, well, I think it's probably more accurate to say that um, during a state of emergency, we qualify for uh, assistance either from FEMA or from the state uh, to deal with the emergency circumstances. And I know that the city is carefully tracking um, the, the COVID-19 response expenses with the, hope of, with the hope of getting some or all of that reimbursed. All right, and so I just think it's important to note because if we were to, you know, no longer be under that state of emergency, then the, the fundings that were spent to deal with COVID response, we wouldn't, my understanding is we wouldn't have a, a clear mechanism for trying to get reimbursed for those funds. Yeah, I think there's a, you know, it's questionable as to whether or not we, and by the way, the state of California still has an emergency declaration in effect too. Um, you know, would we qualify based on the state declaration? Um, you know, the statute is not a model of clarity on that point. So, you know, it's, a, it's, a, a, you know, it's become a routine matter. Um, I realize when the council's asked to ratify executive orders, that's a little bit different. But um, in terms of the emergency declaration, uh, we just monitor the situation and if the condi conditions persist, which they are, or they have, um, then we bring it forward to the council for uh, re-upping it within 60 days. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It looks like we have a member of the public who would like to speak on this item. And I see that your phone number ends in 1810. You'll be unmuted, and when you are, please speak. This is Gary Phillip. As far as this emergency declaration, you should be aware a peer-reviewed study at Stanford states that they did not find evidence to support that non-pharmaceutical interventions, meaning lockdowns, were effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Quote, we failed to find an additional benefit of stay-at-home orders and business closures. Stephen Riley, who is professor of infectious disease dynamics at Imperial College in London, cited a REACT study which shows the prevalence of infection increased after that national lockdown was announced. Quote, it's long enough now that the lockdown working effectively, we certainly would have seen a decline, and current research certainly doesn't support the conclusion that lockdown is working. Academics from Duke, Harvard, and John Hopkins have warned that there could be around a million excess deaths over the next two decades as a result of lockdowns. Recall 500 doctors wrote a letter to Trump stating their concerns and described the lockdowns as a mass, mass casualty incident. Over 6,000 doctors and scientists signed the Great Barrington Declaration urging that those not in the at-risk category should be able to get on with their lives as normal, and that lockdown rules in both the U.S. and the U.K. are causing irreparable damage. Meanwhile, Newsom refuses to release lockdown data to conceal the truth. Given the undeniable massive economic damage, monetary debasement and debt, mounting scientific evidence and massive expert opinion of a lack of efficacy and considerable harm being caused by the current lockdown measures, what do you have to say for yourselves about the emergency declaration and lockdown enforcement, and which careers should be finished? Fauci, Newsom, I say recall Newsom, then jail. Given overwhelming evidence, cloth masks don't protect the wearer at all, and virus transmission via asymptomatic people is rare. COVID testing is done using too high a CT value is giving massive false positive inflated cases and deaths. It seems the government, the press, and Big Pharma are intent on spreading excessive fear of the invisible, a purposeful destruction of small business, and committed an unjustified savaging of individual liberty. Teachers don't want to teach. Workers don't want to work. How do we get the hinky stink off of every aspect of the government lockdown? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I will look for a motion uh, for item 10. Council Member Brown? Yeah, I actually have a, a comment um, or a couple of comments. I wanna be clear that I absolutely support 
the the measures that we are taking to keep our community safe. I'm not, at, you know, saying any of this because I oppose um, shelter in place orders and and other emergency provisions. Um, my concern here is with uh, the executive orders that um, some of them that have been issued. Up until now, I have supported uh, continuing to declare an emergency that comes with that authority for um, the city manager and or designate and or the um, emergency services officer, which has been the city manager, I um, believe that while I have disagreed with some of those executive orders on balance, I thought it was uh, important to maintain that, uh, that authority uh, in order to be nimble in, uh, you know, the, in the face of many crises. Um, that said, I, um, I have become so concerned in particular about the recent, uh, the process for, um, uh, the, the actions that were taken at the San Lorenzo Park and um, the, the the fallout from that. I think that um, I'm just going to say personally, without any, without any discussion of the um, the legal challenge that we now face, um, that the decision ran counter to uh, public health. Uh, good practices, best practices, uh, CDC guidelines. I understand they're only guidelines, but they make them for a reason. They are public health experts, and um, and because of that, I'm I'm sorry to say I can't support this today. I believe the state uh, uh, emergency declaration does qualify us to continue to um, access uh, emergency funds. And um, I, I just can't support continuing to say it's okay to, to make these kinds of decisions without, um, you know, over the holiday, right before, you know, I mean, it just, it, 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 um, it just concerns me enough that I can't, I'm sorry, I can't support that today. And it's, it's not in any way meant to suggest that I, I don't support um, doing any and all things we can to uh, ensure public health and safety is maintained. So I won't be making a motion. I imagine um, there wouldn't be a second, but I'll just register my no vote. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Uh, could I? Is there a uh, Martin? Uh, excuse me, Councilmember uh, Watkins. No, I, I appreciate um, Councilmember Brown's comments, and I understand her concerns, and I also understand the importance of having something like this in place. So, therefore, I'm I'm prepared to go ahead and move this this recommendation. And I see a second with Council Member Older. Yeah, I'll second that. So I have a motion by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Older. All those in favor, please say aye. Do roll call. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Oh, I'm call sorry, now. roll call. Excuse me. <laughs> Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? No. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. So the motion passes with council members Cummings, Golder, Watkins, Kalantari, excuse me, <laughs> Kalantari Johnson, and Vice Mayor Bruner and Mayor Myers voting yes, and Council Member Brown voting no. Great, thank you everyone. We'll move on to our public hearing now. And time check for uh, Council Members, we're running just about 15 minutes late. Um, we had a break scheduled, so we're eating into your little dinner break, so. Just FYI, but of course I want um, full uh, full discussion on all items, but just to let you know kind of where we are for the evening. Next up on our agenda is item number 19, public hearing for 902, 912, and 920 Pacific Avenue and 333 and 423 Front Street. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. This item will be conducted as follows. Staff will present their report. Questions will be received from the council. We will then receive public comment, and then we will return to council deliberation and action. 
If you are interested in commenting on 902, 912, and 920 Pacific Avenue and 333 and 423 Front Street, please press star 9 on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be then be set to two minutes. Uh, our presenter today is Ryan Bain, Senior Planner with our Planning Department. Thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Senior Planner Ryan Bain. Um, can you uh, hear me and see the presentation? We yes, can hear you, but we can't see you, Ryan. I don't know if you want to turn on your video, and we can see the presentation. Thank you. My video is on, but you don't want to see me anyway. It's all. As long as you see the presentation, that's all that matters. So um, thank you. Um, so the proposal we have before the council is uh, consists of five downtown parcels um, spanning between Pacific Avenue and Front Street. Um, they currently consist of the Santa Cruz Metro Transit District owned Metro Station, uh, which is this right here, probably a lot of you are familiar with, as well as the city owned uh, parking lot and then also the city owned NIAC office building. Um, let's see, that, that shows the, uh, the extent of the area and the subject site that we're talking about. So the city and the Santa Cruz Metro District have been conducting outreach and planning for, for redevelopment of, the, of this site uh, since 2002. Um, numerous programs and site layouts have been evaluated through this process. Um, with the preferred site plan locating buildings along Pacific Avenue um, to revitalize and continue the downtown streetscape along Pacific and have the metro station access mainly from um, Front Street. So the proposed land use and zoning changes are consistent with this preferred approach and will facilitate redevelopment of the site. Um, the proposal was heard by the Planning Commission in December um, at a public hearing for the project. Uh, there were no members of the public that spoke at the hearing, um, and the Commission recommended approval to the, to the Council uh, on a 7-0 vote. Here we have a, a very preliminary site plan. Um, staff has been um, having meetings and uh, going over the project, and this is just a very preliminary, this is nothing in, in stone here, but this is kind of gives you an idea of uh, what we're looking at in terms of the city-owned property along Pacific and a, a building being located along there, and then the metro station uh, being accessed off of Front Street. So uh, the city and the metro are now applying as, as co-applicants um, for grants. Uh, these funding programs are, are highly competitive and offered on an annual basis. Um, this past fall, the city and the metro issued a, a request for proposals from a qualified pool of affordable housing developers um, to select the developer to be a co-applicant for the upcoming HCD funding applications. And uh, while the project development plans have yet to be prepared, the city anticipates that there will be up to 100 affordable rental apartments, including a minimum of 25% permanent supportive housing units. So in addition to the affordable housing, the city is also planning to provide retail space um, on the ground floor fronting uh, Pacific Avenue. Um, and the city will continue to own that land and, and ground lease the various components of this mixed use development. And the Metro will continue to own the parcels um, off of Front Street after the re redevelopment. So the proposed project that we're discussing tonight is uh, consists of a general plan amendment, um, rezoning, and a local coastal plan amendment to reconfigure the interface between the regional visitor, commercial, and community facilities land use designations and reconfiguration of the central business district and public facilities zoning designations for these five parcels along Pacific and Front. So the project uh, also includes a coastal permit and boundary line adjustment uh, to combine and reconfigure those uh, four lots um, into two. Uh, and there's also the additional 333 Front Street property um, that's included in the, pro in the project but is not proposed as part of the boundary line adjustment. That's the, uh, the NIAC building. So here uh, represents the existing compar uh, parcel configuration. Parcels one, two, and three are owned by the Metro. Uh, the NIAC building and parcel four, and then the city parking lot, these are the city-owned properties currently. Um, as proposed, um, 
the parcel A would be the city-owned property, and then parcel B and parcel 4 would be owned by the metro. So three of the existing parcels, which are about an acre and a half, are owned by the metro, as I mentioned previously. And these parcels are designated community facility in the general, in the general plan, an LCP, and zoned uh, public facility um, uh, in terms of zoning. The other two parcels, the city-owned parcels, currently uh, around a half acre are owned by the city of Santa Cruz and are designated regional visitor commercial in the general plan and LCP and then zone central business district currently. So the pro proposed boundary line adjustment would reconfigure four of these parcels into two parcels and would generally maintain the existing property sizes as currently exists for the city-owned and metro-owned parcels. Um, this, as I mentioned, the city-owned parcels would front Pacific and have an RBC and GP designation and a central business district zoning designation. Um, the southern portion of the site already has these designations and the net change in land area for the designation is really nominal. Um, the metro and parcels would be along Front Street and um, would uh, have a community facility G general plan designation and public facility uh, zoning designation. So the proposed uh, general plan zoning map and LCP amendments are, are found to be consistent with a number of goals, policies, and programs contained in our 2030 general plan, um, our local coastal program, and our downtown plan. I've listed a bunch of those in our, in our staff report. I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but I'll just mention a few highlights um, in terms of our consistency with our general plan. Uh, the project certainly encourages higher intensity residential uses in the downtown area. Uh, facilitates the development of affordable housing, um, collaborates with nonprofit um, and other interested parties to develop affordable housing, um, and it promotes transit-oriented mixed-use residential developments that are, are close to services and reduce dependence on, on automobile use being in the downtown. In terms of LCP policies, um, the uh, mixed-use residential and commercial uh, development is in the city's downtown central business district. Um, it provides for high density development and mixed uses, um, pedestrian oriented land use to reduce dependence on the auto and support the use of mass transit, certainly being the metro station does that. Um, and then also um, with providing the retail, continual retail along Pacific, uh, it activates those ground level uses. In terms of downtown pol plan policies, um, again, housing uh, in the downtown along Pacific uh, provides that, um, enhances the pedestrian, bike, and transit access to downtown. Um, and again, that continuity of active ground level uses along Pacific, um, and then also has housing as the principal upper level use in the downtown. In terms of a coastal permit, the subject site is located just within the coastal zone boundary, um, and staff in reviewing the coastal section of the zoning code that lists uh, certain exclusions from requiring coastal permits for certain types of projects, it really wasn't clear uh, whether a boundary line adjustment would require a coastal permit, so just out of an abundance of, of caution, we, we've included approval of a coastal permit as part of this, so to be safe. And then also the boundary line adjustment, as I mentioned, it's, um, it's a reconfiguration um, of four of the five parcels into two parcels. Um, the total lot areas owned by the metro and city would generally remain the same, um, just reconfigured. And the central business district zone district does require a minimum of 5,000 square foot parcel size, um, while the um, public facility zone district does not indicate a minimum lot size, so certainly uh, the proposed lot sizes um, meet these minimum requirements. So the project is uh, exempt from CEQA uh, pursuant to section 15305 for minor alterations in land use, as well as uh, 15061 for projects that clearly would not result in a significant effect on the environment. So in terms of next steps, um, from tonight. So the proposed uh, zoning map ordinance amendment will require a second reading by the council 
um, and I think that's tentatively scheduled for February uh, 9th, the next meeting. And if approved, um, together with the general plan land use designation amendment, will also require approval by the California Coastal Commission uh, as an LCP amendment. So um, one of the resolutions that you have uh, has been included as part of um, the approval is to authorize staff to submit um, the LCP amendment to the California Coastal Commission for review and approval. So the proposal um, is intended to provide flexibility and design for a joint project between the city and the metro, redevelopment of the metro station, and a potential 100% affordable housing and mixed use project that is being considered by the city for the reconfigured city-owned site. Um, so therefore, staff is recommending that the city council, uh, one, adopt a resolution acknowledging the environmental determination and approving the general plan amendment, rezoning and local coastal program amendment, coastal permit and boundary line adjustment uh, based on the findings and conditions of approval included in the prepared draft resolution, and then also introduce for publication an ordinance amending the, the zoning map. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Donna, you're muted, by the way. Sorry, my dogs have been barking all afternoon, so I keep muting. Um, I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Ryan, for the presentation. Um, I'll open it up to questions from the council now and uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you uh, for that presentation. I had two questions. Um, one was regarding the NIAC building. My understanding is that um, I'm not sure which department, if it's finance or if it's another department, but I know that that building's being utilized by the city uh, for staff, and I was just curious as to what, um, is there a plan for where those people will move to? Uh, so just kind of wanted to throw that out there as a question. I might leave that question to is Jessica DeWitt or David McCormick in our Economic Development Department available to maybe answer that question? Um, Ryan, this is Bonnie. I, I can feel that. I mean, we've Great. been in discussions with finance, both finance and water department um, have, have offices there and, um, you know, we have been working with them. It's going to be a, a, a little bit, you know, a couple of years actually before we're, you know, break ground on that site. So our hope is that we have some alternative options for staff by that time. We have looked um, in the downtown um, for other other options. We actually do also have some city, other city property that we own that we're looking at as well. So we're looking sort of holistically at sort of, you know, office needs across the city, obviously during the pandemic. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting situation in that for the finance department, um, we have the luxury at the NIAC building, which is so large, of, of spreading folks out. But the reality is, you know, post-pandemic, um, that will need less, somewhat less space than what they're utilizing now. So we'll definitely be looking now at that over the next um, over the next year. Great. And then, oh. sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Justin. Yeah, and then I just had one more question and. Um, Bonnie, I think you touched on it a little bit. So just thinking about the timeline um, from where we're at to groundbreaking, I guess, what are some of the next steps? So it sounds like the LCP amendment uh, will go to the Coastal Commission, and then I guess what are the next kind of steps in terms of timeline for when we can see um, groundbreaking taking place? So some of that will depend on our financing. Um, so we're in the process of, um, you know, then that's one of the next items as well, of um, going through uh, 20, AB 2162 um, to be able to expedite some of the sort of permitting timeline. And that will put us in a good position um, to be able to apply for IIG and ASIC funding. And so once we find out about that round, that really sort of sets our timeline. Um, so if we don't get that funding, um, we may may strategically have to use more of our city funding, affordable housing trust fund. Obviously, we want to leverage that as far as we can go. So we're applying for every grant that's possible and really we're sort of tearing off that from the timeline. So we have um, our consultant who specializes in um, both of these grants working with us. And so we believe we're putting the best uh, competitive project forward. So we're hopeful um, on that, but that will really be driving the timeline is uh, the, the results and responses that we get to our grant applications. Um, we 
also do need to work with Metro, um, and we have been w working well together on the overall site design uh, for both the Metro Tarmac, you know, obviously in our project, and the number of units as well um, that we can maximize on this site. So we will have touch points where we come back to you again and sort of determining, um, you know, that, that sort of complete site program plan, which we're working on now um, with our consultants and with other departments internally at the city. But um, I think the earliest expectation for even breaking ground would probably be at least two years out. Okay, thank you. Minimum. Yeah. Great. Are there other questions from council members at this point? Not seeing any. So I will go ahead and take this out to public comment now. And I am seeing three hands raised. Um, the first person would be Irene Lennox, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, Irene Lennox. Uh, for some years, I've been involved with one of the local food pantries and mainly in do dealing with interviews for financial aid. So I'm very aware of the need in the city for affordable housing. So I would like to speak in favor of both this project and the next one, number 20 on the agenda, uh, the Calvary project. It is so good to see projects coming forward with so many units that will be affordable instead of just a tiny percentage of those being built being built for people who are really in need of affordable housing. So please pass this, push this project forward and also uh, the same with uh, the Calgary project that follows. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker would be um, with the phone number ending in 8767. You'll be unmuted and you'll be able to speak. Hi, my, Hi, Hi my name is Jeff Morgan. How are you doing today? Um, so I'm president of First Community. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Oh, oh, okay, great. No, I, all I wanted to say is we're thrilled to be working on the affordable housing component in partnership uh, with Methune Architects and with Metro and uh, uh, beginning this journey of service to see how we can uh, really help some of the uh, more vulnerable citizens in Santa Cruz. And uh, this is the perfect site and the perfect time to do it. And so we just, well, I just wanted to let you know we are here and we're of service. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you very much. And the next speaker I have up is with the phone number ending in 3349. You'll be unmuted and then you can speak. Bonnie, did you unmute them? Yeah, I can't unmute them. They have to unmute themselves, but I authorized them to, to here we go. Okay, great, there they go. Welcome. Hi. Hi, this is Donna Murphy, and I'm calling in support of this item and item 20 as well. I've been involved with the COPA housing team for a number of years. COPA is organi organizations um, organized Communities Organized for Relational Power and Action, which is actually 26 member institutions. And we have been looking at affordable housing for a long time. We have heard from all of our in member institutions about how hard it is on our families. And so we want, and many of those voices can't be heard because of flexibility for these meetings. They can't show up here. So me and some of my other colleagues are calling in to make sure their voices are heard. We strongly support this project and, and all of the downtown affordable housing projects because they really enable more families to live near transit and vital services. This action is pivotal to realizing a major improvements in our downtown as well creating affordable housing, improved public transit, and a really vibrant, walkable, industrious downtown. So we appreciate you moving on this and hope it happens really fast. Thank you. Thank you. 
I believe that we have um, heard from everyone that wish to speak from the public. I'll bring it back to the council. So we'll uh, return for council deliberation and action. And I have three council members, council member Cummings, Brown, and Watkins. I'm not sure if I got that in the right order. I'm sorry, I'm monitoring the attendees, um, but I will call on you in that order. Um, and uh, starting with council member Cummings, please. I just wanna thank the staff and, um, and the members of the the members of our council who've been on the um, the Metro board who have really helped to bring this forward. So thank you, Mayor Myers and um, other council members who've served on that board in the past who have done a tremendous job of working on this project to collaborate with Metro and bring this forward. Um, I'm really happy to see you know another affordable housing project go into our community that's really gonna help um, you know low income families. And so I'm prepared to move the staff recommendation um, the resolution acknowledging the environmental determination and approving the general plan amendment, rezoning and local coastal program amendment, coastal permit and boundary line adjustment based on the findings and conditions of approval, including the attached draft resolution and introduced for publication and ordinance amending the zoning map. And I would look for a second. Council member Brown. I'll second that. Uh, Wholeheartedly, I, I just echo uh, Council Member Cummings' comments, uh, just acknowledging you know the tremendous amount of work that has gone into getting us to this point uh, from our staff, uh, Metro board representatives from the council, and many, many other uh, stakeholders in the community. Um, so I'm just thrilled to uh, be taking another step in this direction in the in the direction of more affordable housing in our community. Okay. And is there any other council members that have comments? I'll just um, I'll just quickly just state um, that uh, it's great to be here because I think the very first week that I started as a council member, I met with the um, staff, um, and we have staff from three different departments working on this project. So it's been a um, an amazing uh, couple of years that this is right here, right now. So um, I really want to recognize Bonnie Lipscomb's work, um, also Claire Fleece, Claire Gauss, Galugali. <laughs> Claire, I can't use your last name anymore. Um, can't pronounce it right. Uh, and others who have really just been very helpful in helping the council members who are on the Metro Board understand the project. Uh, I want to recognize Lee Butler and the planning department and their work on this. Um, it's just been a huge lift, and um, I also want to recognize Council Member Matthews. She served um, in the two years that I did on the Metro Board. She was instrumental in helping move this project forward as well. And um, yeah, it's just been great, and I really want to acknowledge Metro as well. This is a, a really important project for um, revitalizing the regional center of our transit, really of our whole entire transit district. Um, and it's exciting to see the reconfiguration and the kinds of um, uh, access that will provide for electric buses and other things that the, that the district is working on. So it really is a win-win for, for everyone. And um, yeah, just extremely excited about this project in Metro South. Uh, and I feel like we will, we will be very competitive for funding for this. And so um, hopefully in a couple years time, we'll be opening up some new housing for for folks in our community who really need it. So thank you to all of our staff and thank you to Metro um, for everything that you guys have been doing at the staff level. And with that, um, I will call for a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. And that um, motion was by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown, and that motion uh, passed unanimously.
Well, uh, we've all earned a little bit of extra time for our dinner break. So we are going to take a break now. Um, it was scheduled for 5.15, we're a little early. Why don't we come back at um, 5.50, a little bit before six and get started. We do have uh, an item for general business this evening and uh, also for advisory body appointments and reappointments. So maybe everybody can come back at, at uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, 5.50, not 6.50. Um, and we will go on break for now. Thanks everybody. Two, three, four. <clears throat> Shut them. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. It's five fifty. Thank you, everyone, for uh, getting back in on time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the general business item for this evening. Uh, this is item number 20, AB 2162, Affordable Supportive Housing Projects. Increase in the number of units allowed as a use by right. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. If you are interested in commenting on AB 2162 affordable supportive housing projects, increase in the number of units allowed as a use by right, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. The item, item number 20 is again, the AB 2162 affordable supportive housing projects increase in the number of units allowed as a use by right. We'll have a, uh, a presentation by Matt Van Hua, the principal planner on the project. Hi Matt. Hello, good evening mayor, vice mayor and council. Let me bring up the presentation here. Can everyone see that okay? Great. Thanks. So again, this is it's a, a little, it's a little zoomed weird. Sorry to interrupt, but it's a little like zoomed in. I don't know if it's just my screen though. Okay it looks okay on my end. Okay, I just went to full screen. Now I can see it. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Uh, so again, this is a AB 2162 affordable supportive housing projects as a use by right. And just for some brief, brief background again, uh, Assembly Bill 2162 was signed into law in 2018. And it's for supportive housing as a use by right. And supportive housing per this bill is considered a 100% affordable project with a 25% of 25% of those units or 12 units, uh, whichever is greater, uh, that are that are part of uh, supportive housing. And supportive housing specifically is uh, is, is how our housing units 
for a target population, which is either homeless or disabled. And there's a, there's a service component to the supportive housing as well on site. And then as far as use by right goes, uh, that's really defined by a, a more streamlined approval process where a project would go through a ministerial or administrative approval process and there's no CEQA uh, environmental review uh, for projects that meet the AB 2162 requirements. And given the size of Santa Cruz, the state, the, the bill already does require that projects 50 units or fewer that are supportive housing uh, be by right, uh, but that limit can be increased with policy, and that's what brings us here today. And just as a further background to this, Council approved a policy in August of last year for three specified projects over 50 units. And uh, one, one of those projects ended up using that. Uh, one other ended up staying at 50 units so far, and another one continued on with its, with its uh, uh, original uh, approval process and didn't, didn't need the additional streamlining after all. Uh, as part of the policy as well, uh, it was determined that a uh, design permit was not necessary for projects on public property. Uh, and that there would be a ministerial process for those. And that's just because projects on public property tend to have a, a, you know, additional oversight from the city already and, and don't need that additional design permit process. Uh, whereas uh, design permit for projects on private property uh, would be required. And so there would be one community, there would be one community meeting and an administrative approval process for uh, the projects on private property. And so the, the two projects that are coming, for, coming forward today uh, for the supportive housing uh, by right increase are Calvary Church at 538 Cedar Street. Uh, it's currently proposed as a, a three-story project of uh, 65 units, uh, but we're, uh, we're currently uh, increasing that to 75 units in the policy just to allow for additional design flexibility. And then the second project is Pacific Station North uh, at 928 Pacific and 333 Front Street, which you're, which you're pretty uh, uh, well versed in now given the, the previous presentation tonight. Uh, so you're fairly well uh, understanding of that site plan already. But uh, just, for, uh, just for some further information, here's a, a very preliminary uh, site plan for the Cavalry Church site, just for additional information. You have a commercial space along Cedar Street, the residential amenities and services located here, and then a public paseo uh, connecting across the site uh, from Cedar Street to Center Street. And so with, with both of these projects, there are some conditions that, we, that were placed within the policy. Um, and those, those conditions were to ensure the supportive housing and inclusionary requirements are met. They were their fairly standard conditions just, just to show that the projects are meeting the AB 2162 requirements and the city's inclusionary requirements. Um, and then for Cavalry Church project, uh, since it was since it's in such an initial design stage, uh, we staff did in, include additional design conditions on the project, and those were largely related to downtown plan language, since it's within the downtown plan area, uh, and the downtown plan language really on the design and also public right of way extensions uh, through the project. And, uh, and the extension of uh, Cathcart as a, as a public right-of-way in that paseo that I showed earlier. So with that, the, you know, the, the benefits of this is that uh, uh, you know, support, this policy really streamlines and encourages the production of affordable and supportive housing and helps the city achieve uh, lower income affordability housing goals. And uh, this unit increase is only for the two specified projects with these conditions in place as well. Uh, so this, the, effect on the, uh, the effect of this policy is, uh, is defined. So with that, the, the resolution, I won't read all of this, but uh, it, it essentially wraps up in that it, it we're allowing uh, one project up to 75 
development units for Calvary Church and one project up to 120 units, the Pacific Station North Metro project up to the 120 units. Um, and that we would continue following the AB 2162 requirement for projects under 50 units and that all projects uh, that meet the AB 2162 requirements, regardless of their unit count, uh, go through a design permit process if, if they are not on city-owned property. If it's a privately owned project, it would go through that design permit and administrative approval process with at least one community meeting held. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the presentation. Um, I'll go ahead and look for council members to have questions. Uh, council member Cummings. My computer is moving a little slow, so pardon me if uh, it's taking me a minute to get online. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks for that presentation, and um, it's really exciting again to see you know some more affordable housing projects come online. Um, the question I have, I have two questions. One uh, is related to parking. I was just curious uh, how many parking spaces will be coming offline with the Cavalry project? You said come, coming offline? Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, uh, given that the, the project is early. Uh, I, I believe the project planner, uh, Ryan Bain, is on the line. Do you happen to have an answer for that, Ryan? This is Bonnie. I, I, I think Mark Dettles on, I think it's 108, um, but someone from Public Works or Ryan could confirm that. Yeah, I, I don't know the number. I mean, my first thought is to get on the aerial and, and count, <laughs> but I, I don't know the actual number, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just curious because I know this has been, you know, parking in the downtown has been an issue. And I know for some folks, when I was starting on council, they were, you know, saying, well, we don't know when these projects are going to come online. Um, you know, we have plenty of parking. And seeing these projects emerge and the loss of parking, I think it's going to be something to really take into consideration, especially as we're increasing uh, the density of people staying downtown. And so my second question um, it's just some, it's a question and a concern, but you know, when as someone who lives in the beach flats, which is one of the lower income communities in Santa Cruz, um, having sufficient parking has been an issue where um, there's not enough spaces in this neighborhood, and as a result, as a result, people end up parking illegally. They end up getting tickets, and so they're that burden of um, you know paying for a parking pass but then not having adequate parking and then getting a ticket as a result is something that people really face down here as a challenge. And, you know, both of these projects, it looks like, you know, they're not going to have parking, which is something that's going to help the affordability of those projects and getting these projects built. And so my question is around, you know, kind of dealing with the parking issues that come with not providing parking at these two sites. I know that people will be able to uh, potentially park at the garage that will be built with the library project. But I guess my question is, you know, for people who maybe don't commute every day, is there any plan for, you know, how people will be able to um, park their cars for longer durations of time if they live in these forms of housing? So, you know, because I could imagine that people aren't going to, you know, need to move their car every single day. And so is there some kind of, you know, parking permit program that's going to be established to allow people in these um, units to be able to keep their cars parked in certain areas for longer durations of time? I just wanted to mention I counted 107 spaces approximately. Thanks. Councilmember Cummings, I can speak to the Metro project. Um, so I do know that First Community Housing is planning to have uh, Metro passes, Metro bus passes, um, free to the to the residents or at a deeply discounted rate, and we're, that's something that we're working out with Metro. Um, I can also speak to the, the recently constructed Water Street Apartments project that a lot of the tenants don't have cars, and so having access to bus passes is actually more important than a parking space. Um, so that's just feedback I have for Metro. Thanks. Great, thank you. 
Uh, yeah, and just to follow up on that too, the uh, the Calvary project is it's so early right now. We haven't spoken yet about transportation demand management options or anything like that yet. Okay. Yeah, it's just something. That's certainly, I, certainly an option. Yeah, I was just thinking it's something maybe to to keep in mind, um, just because we're like, I mean, it's unclear, you know, how many people are going to have cars who live in these units, but um, just understanding the increase in population downtown and the impact that that could potentially have on parking, I think is something to keep in mind. I would just add, Councilmember Cummings, that um, the uh, residents would need to go through the, the standard parking permit pass program um, that we have in our downtown. There is a waiting list for that right now. Um, and so, you know, that would need to be taken into consideration. Um, and um, through the use of these bills, given the proximity to the Metro, we actually can't require parking for the residential portions, but your point is well taken that even if we can't require it as, you know, on-site parking, there will be people with cars and they'll need to um, make that choice about whether or not to um, pursue, um, you know, use of a Metro Transit Pass, whether that's provided or not, or to buy into um, the parking pass program. Um, and that'll be something that they need to, to weigh. So I guess a follow up to that, because I think the one concern that I have is just like not disproportionately impacting um, people who are low income um, because that's the only housing they can afford. And so I wonder too, if there might be some kind of, you know, special program for this type of housing. Cause it sounds like if, if not, you know, if there aren't gonna be a ton of people um, in, this, in this type of housing who need cars, then can certain exceptions be made so that, you know, if somebody's moving in and they need to drive to work every day, that, you know, they're not penalized by having to get on a wait list for a long, for who knows how long, <clears throat> and wait for a, uh, you know, parking pass that is, you know, really um, that that they need in order in order to get back and forth to, to their jobs. So I just feel like there's a, a number of factors to weigh there, and you know, whether or not we can come up with solutions now. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say um, that's a conversation that we can have with Public Works, and um, you know, there are a couple things that come to mind there. You know, one, I think they've been exploring ideas surrounding uh, a residential parking pass, which you know, where people are there um, are away during the day, but then um, there in the evenings. Um, or what I was thinking you might be going towards at one point was sort of like. Uh, prioritization on a waiting list for individuals within the uh, low-income um, apartments. Um, so I think there are things that can be explored and, and we would want to loop Public Works in on those. Great, thanks. And next I had uh, Council Member Bruner, then Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, I was also curious how much of all of these uh, developments and the parking aspect will be discussed in the downtown commission, since that's the downtown parking district commission with uh, potential um, modes of parking and rates and fees for, for some of these new homes coming on to the downtown. Uh, is that Lee or I don't know if, if uh, Mark Dell's on. <coughs> Not sure which, that's, which, which that's team. That's an interesting question, Vice Mayor, Mayor Bruner. Um, I think we'll need to look carefully at the state law as it relates to that. That was a question that, um, that has arisen. I don't know if um, anyone here on the line um, has uh, an answer to that. The question that arose is, was given that this um, is receiving the, um, the um, ministerial AB 2162 provisions through this policy, and there would be a discretionary, or there would be a, uh, a design permit for the Cedar Street, but not for the Metro. Would one or either of those still be required to go to the Downtown Commission? Um, the answer may be no under the streamlining provisions. Um, we haven't gone through and worked that out um, entirely in, it, in its legality. 
And just to, to give you a, a quick heads up, you know, what happens at the downtown commission for these downtown projects is essentially they're asked whether or not there is sufficient parking supply in the downtown to um, move um, uh, forward with a reduced parking ratio and um, in lieu fees rather than the provision of parking on site. Um, and then that, that decision would, that would be a recommendation that the decision-making body, the zoning administrator, planning commission, or council, whoever that may be, would consider in making their approval. In this instance, because that second level of approval process isn't happening, I suspect that we would not be going to the downtown commission for this, but it is something that we still want to confirm from a, a legal perspective, but that's, that's my take on the, the question right now. Uh, Council Member Brown. Yeah, just as a follow up to uh, Council Member Cummings and uh, Vice Mayor Bruner's uh, questions, uh, I guess so, so. I would I agree that I think you know it would be it would be interesting to try to come and well important really to try to come up with a way to um, provide some access for uh, future residents uh, to access parking permits at a lower rate. And I just want to highlight the fact that we, you know, our residential parking permit program is is very affordable and it is uh, available to residents, in this case with the Calvary uh, project, literally across the street. So um, I'm just, you know, it just seems like it would be worth trying to, and maybe it is something the downtown commission could take a look at as, you know, a, a broader policy question if it's not so much to legally mandate it, but, or if it's legally required, but just because it could be a useful thing to do to um, identify opportunities for uh, folks who, who, um, who may need those permits um, at an affordable rate to, to be able to access them. Uh, and I know we can't differentiate based on income with our parking permit um, program, uh, parking permit costs within a particular parking area, but maybe there are ways that we could, you know, get creative. So it seems like it would be worth bringing the downtown commission and potentially, or, or just public works, um, and maybe coming back to give us some thoughts on, on what, what we might be able to do. Council member Watkins and then council member Cummings. My, uh, a little bit of a comment and then um, somewhat of a question or a suggestion, but I think, you know, one of the things to kind of contextualize this is the hope to have affordable housing in our downtown is really about sustainable communities where you can walk and um, access all the things that you want to do without needing a car, which is also really in line with our climate goal. So essentially kind of making that um, our, part of our vision for the downtown with the downtown plan amendment as well as the shared parking and maximizing parking model. So just kind of contextually, that's sort of the hope is that there aren't as much of a need for cars, but there are people who need their cars. So I definitely follow the logic in wanting to support those individuals or families. Um, and I know that in certain areas, you see the shared sort of car model, like a zip car uh, type opportunity when you just need a car when you need one. And I'm wondering if that's something that's also gone into sort of the thought around um, how to support these uh, developments that don't have dedicated parking. I'd say that's certainly uh, a consideration. Um, I would say they need to be in the uh, public parking garages, for example, or public lots, um, seeing as you know there aren't any parking spaces being provided on um, these particular projects. Um, but yes, I, I do see that as one component, and I know we've got some locations downtown already. Um, I don't know to what extent Public Works is exploring the expansion of that, but I think that um, particularly as projects like this move forward, there will be higher demand for those. And so um, I, I think it's, it's worth exploring with our Public Works Department and how we're meeting everyone's needs because you know there may, there may be an instance where you need to uh, rent a pickup for a, a couch <laughs> move or something of that sort. I have Councilmember Cummings. 
just had a quick question because I, I, we received um, a couple emails related to this, but I was just wondering um, with the height or the the number the limit on the number of units. I guess how is that determined? Because some folks have written to us and like you should increase it, you know, to 100 units and then you know maximize it to the greatest extent possible. And so I'm just wondering for um, members of the community who contacted us with those questions, kind of what was the um, what what um, determine those numbers in terms of the number of units? Certainly, yeah, the, the numbers are currently set slightly higher than what the proposals have come into us as. For instance, Calvary has originally proposed 65 units for their project, and, and that's currently what the developer has proposed, and staff felt there should be some leeway and, and increase that to 75. Uh, and we haven't heard we haven't heard anything else uh, whether that needed to be from the developer was that should have been increased more or not we're really just basing it on that initial proposal and that's same with the metro project as well it's currently uh, at about 100 units and we increased that to 120 for that same flexibility uh, so it's certainly an option to to increase that increase that number allowed uh, but it's not to say whether the developers of those projects will actually hit that number or not. It would be up to them. Okay, I've got Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Brown. I do just wanna um, let everybody know, I was texting with um, our, some of our uh, public works staff. Claire Galagli is now uh, available for questions regarding parking as, need, as necessary, I know. So you know she she joined in Claire. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I can't get your name your your uh, your last name pronounced correctly tonight. No problem. It's Galogly. Galogly. There we go. Okay, uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Great. Thank you. Um, I think you may have might have addressed in that, but just to clarify that um, if we were to look at increasing that number for the Cedar Street from the buffer of 65 to 75 and increase it to 100, it's not a condition of approval, right? It's again, just for us to have that flexibility and have the option to explore. Just wanna make sure that that's clear, correct? Correct, yep, we were just worded as up to 100. So yeah, not a requirement. And then my other question is um, really great points and questions around the parking. Um, issue, that's not something that we need to address in terms of staff recommendation right now, correct? This is something that we would, um, should the project move forward, um, work with staff to, to iron out. Okay, thank you. Correct. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to respond to the question about increasing the number uh, for this particular project. And I don't want to speak for the developer, but having talked with their representatives uh, in just back in December about the project, I asked that question, you know, gee, it would be great to see a, a, you know, more units in a project like this. And um, th at that point, they said that because, as we know, you know, the, the level of complexity and the layering of financing is, you know, it, it, it's, it's very complex, uh, that in their estimation that um, it, the, for financing wise, it, it didn't make sense for them to build more. Um, but again, I, I just am putting that out there with the caveat that um, I'm not speaking for them. I think that, um, you know, it may be worth asking, but I, in terms of making that decision tonight, I, you know, I don't think it would affect their particular plans. And I will say we do have the developer on the line as well, uh, Matt Tooney, who might be able to, to shed light on that as well. Oh, good, tonight. because that's Thanks. great. Thank you. <laughs> Better them than me. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mr. Tooney, if you're, on, if you're on the line and you'd like to respond to that now, um, since we are doing questions from council, I'd be happy to have you uh, respond to um, that question. Welcome. Thank you. I wasn't I wasn't sure of the process here, so I just kind of raised my hand there. There so you go. That's that's the process. <laughs> better, better safe than sorry. Thank, yeah. Um, well, I mean, first, you know, thanks um, to everybody, um, staff, Bonnie, Lee, uh, Ryan, and Matt. I mean, a lot of work has been put into this project, and it's exciting. It's 
seems to be moving uh, quickly and I think a good a good direction. I want to just I'll just answer that question specifically on the unit count. Um, and Council Member Browns, your your answer was exactly uh, point on. It is very complex. The 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 financing and the feasibility is going to dictate a lot of this. That said, you know this is still. I mean, you've seen the site plan. That is really the the extent of the planning so far. It's it's still somewhat of a blank slate. We're open to looking at potentially doing more units. I mean, at the at the end of the day, we. This is, I, I totally have heard in talking to stakeholders and members of the community that comment about why not do more. Um, and that's a, a very valid question. And we're, we're, we understand the opportunity and that the site should produce as much housing as it can. That said, it's got to, you know, it has to work from a financing standpoint. And, and there's some, you know, we'll work through that we need to do in that regard. The height of the building um, is also of a, you know, we, we need to make sure we're working with the church next door. Um, and just by way of a, a little background there, um, my partners and I, you know, we were the same developers that did 1010 Pacific, um, which uh, was kind of our, our, the reason that we've um, first identified the parking lot, the, the church side as, as an area of opportunity and got in discussions with the church. Um, and we're very appreciative of their involvement and their input on this. But the, you know, the height of the building, that's, it's going to be a new, you know, that's going to be a new neighbor for them. Um, so shading and, you know, that that's, uh, has been a consideration. So we're, we're open to looking at it 75 or hundred were my, my thought is that it's going to end up being the right amount regardless. So that cap, um, I think it's up to you guys. Um, while I have the uh, floor, can I just make yes, please, one of the go comments? Ahead. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I've been um, all the all the comments and questions have been really helpful. Um, the the one, and we're, we're very excited about the project. Um, providing this type of housing is obviously super needed. Um, the parking comments have all been well. You know, I, I um, appreciated all those. Um, the one, the one condition that we want to make sure that we have a little more discussion on, and, and perhaps have the opportunity to really digest and, and understand, is the uh, condition number four regarding the paseo. Um, we we absolutely view that as a as a you know the opportunity to provide a paseo there with um, you know the access points and, and supporting the downtown plan with circulation pedestrian access, all is, a, is you know, makes total sense. Um, it can be a real amenity to the project. Um, you know, 515 Kitchen next door with their tent, which, you know, um, provides some outdoor dining. Um, it could be a very nice, attractive feature for that part of town. The, the getting back to the finances and the complexity, we're very concerned just on the, on the cost to improve it. Um, our, our finance modeling to date has, has not included any cost to improve it. I guess, you know, this is our, our perception or our, our, the way we envision the project, that strip of land being a city owned land, city owned piece, we were thinking and, and, you know, right, wrong or different that that was going to be, we were staying clear of it and the city would be improving it. We don't have um, we haven't included in our budget to do that, so that's a real concern to us. So we're, and at this point, I don't even know what is involved with it and the cost. And is it a, is it a vehicular? Is it just pedestrian? You know, there's so many questions that that condition uh, is con is a concern to us. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tunney. Um, I have Council Member Golder and Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I just have a question regarding what you just said. So, uh, Matt, this is for Matt. So, does that, I just wonder with that Paseo in place, does that affect whether the project would happen or not if it was there? I, I, it's, again, tough to tell. I can tell you that the, uh, the finances right now, we're actually, 
um, you know, we've we've started to relook at them. There's a, there's um, a number of different you know call it balancing acts that take into place the the uh, the amount of affordability. I mean, the project's 100% affordable. That's a given. The amount of affordability on the you know call it the supportive housing component at 20%. Uh, we, you know, there have been, we, we are, the, the numbers that we're looking at makes it, it, it appears difficult to make the project financeable. We looked at raising the 30 to the, the, call it the very low or the support of housing slightly higher. So we're still, so the short answer is we're still running numbers. Construction costs are coming in higher. The, the, in general, the numbers are very challenging. And so, in short, putting on, I mean, I, I, Paseo could easily be, you know, a half a million dollars. I mean, it, that's, I know that sounds like a lot, but with drainage and paving and, you know, getting the grading section in there and so forth, the dollars can and mount up very quickly. That would make the project uh, definitely unfeasible. Yes. Now, there, there, you know, there may be things that we're doing along the Paseo uh, that would qualify as improvements anyways, uh, landscaping, you know, along the building edge. Um, I've talked to Bonnie, who's been very helpful about talking about the, you know, um, uh, some programs to uh, perhaps have uh, murals, um, you know, painted on the walls or facades facing the Paseo. So there, there's things that, that may be done with the project that in a sense provide some of the improvement, but the ultimate cost is definitely a question. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Mr. Toomey, for being here and responding to questions and um, bringing up some of your um, areas of concern. Uh, this is a question to your staff around the Paseo. Um, is there opportunity during the design process to work with the applicants and, and find um, some kind of solution that would be agreeable and, and not be um, an impactful cost constraint for the developers, for the applicants. Yeah, so certainly that's something that would have to be worked out more during the during the design review process. Uh, since since what we've received so far is so preliminary. And we we haven't worked extensively with the applicant on on the design or, or build of that Paseo condition yet. Um, so just that would that would be worked out further in the process. Do you have anything more to add on that, Lee? Sure. I would just say that yes, you know, there isn't a design at this point, and um, you know, we as a city would be cognizant of kind of the several various factors, you know, one, we want to make sure that this is a high quality environment for our downtown. At the same time, we'd be recognizing that, you know, this is an affordable housing project that we want to make happen. And so, you know, as we work through with Public Works on those design elements, how can we balance those factors along with various other things like public safety and uh, accepted community uh, crime prevention through environmental design principles and um, you know, from a, a security perspective, you know, uh, working with them to understand, uh, working with police and public works to understand, you know, should that be gated or, uh, you know, and, and, you know, only allow daytime access. You know, there are a lot of different details, but certainly, um, you know, one of those factors is the cost and understanding how we can get the, the biggest bang for our buck in terms of, um, you know, not burdening the project uh, too significantly while also creating a great public space. Thank you. And Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings uh, and Jessica DeWitt with staff. Um, did you wanna comment on that, Jessica? I was just going to add that um, I'm not sure what the developers planning in terms of project-based section eight. I know, I know we were in contact with the housing authority for the Metro project 
Um, I think that this developer has also been in contact with the housing authority, and if there's the possibility to uh, ask or request more housing vouchers, in which case the, the developer could essentially ask for a larger mortgage, um, a conventional mortgage, because they can show more to pay debt. Um, so, so possibly that's one way to generate a few more bucks to be able to put towards the Paseo. Or again, I don't know what, what the developer is assuming for paying for impact fees or uh, any of the other fees that are coming for permitting, but if they are requesting a waiver or uh, any kind of a deferral, possibly those funds could be reallocated towards Paseo improvements. Just some thoughts out there to throw. Thank you. Okay, I had, um, let's see, uh, I think I'll take Council Member Brown and Cummings questions and then Mr. Tenney, I'll, I'll turn back to you for any responses. Yeah, I just wanted to advocate for, uh, or, or at least express my uh, support for um, trying to find ways to ensure that uh, that the improvements for this particular Paseo um, not be so onerous as to potentially compromise the project. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting that's anybody's intention here, but you know, it seems to me this is, you know, a we approve many projects and um, we, um, you know, we don't necessarily, I mean, I, I, you know, we don't necessarily get the same public benefit out of um, those projects because of the affordability, the deep affordability and the supportive housing in this case. So, uh, you know, I just, is there, I guess the question with that is, is there something that we, that the city council um, could or should do in terms of direction to try to, um, make that happen, or will we just kind of hear back if there's a, a problem at some point? I, I'm just trying to kind of trying to figure out how to how to proceed to do everything we can to support this. Um, I think you know we're all on the same page in terms of you know wanting to help make affordable housing happen and. Um, and you know we want great spaces in our downtown as well. Um, they don't have to be mutually exclusive, but uh, sometimes they can be a competing. Uh, they can be competing interests. You know, certainly if you um, maximize the programming and the materials um, uh, quality within that paseo, you could go up. You know, substantially higher than five hundred thousand dollars. I would say, um, but you know, I think there are things that we can do. To minimize those costs, um, and um, that involves the programming, or that involves you know coordination with with fire, for example, to say, hey, you know, well, does this have to be an EVA, or can we just uh, program it as uh, pedestrian access, so the the at grade work is less expensive. So um, I think that we've got that um, uh, everyone's mutual interest of making the project happen in mind. Um, and um, I think if there were issues, then you know, there wouldn't be anything that would preclude us from um, seeking advice later on down the line. Um, but uh, I do think you know, with, with public works and um, with planning and with economic development, we'd all be um, balancing those factors. Um, and you know, I think Jessica chimed in with some ideas that um, you know she's got a lot of knowledge around. You know, to the extent that um, the developer wants to work with our um, economic development department on you know exploring additional financing options um, or additional um, ways to generate additional revenue. I think you know there are a lot of different ways in which we can um, work with the applicant to to make sure that the project happens. Can, can I just follow up really quickly? I, I don't want to take too much time on this, but I, you know, I just want to say, um, you know, so some of the things that you're raising, uh, Lee, and I, you know, and I'm in no way suggesting that the intention here is to um, make it more difficult for um, this particular developer, but you know, we. It's the first time I've heard of the idea of um, should it be a locked gate? You know, we we've approved. Uh, developments uh, with Paseos um, and never has that been come up and maybe that's because 
the um, the DevCon development that was approved, the Riverfront project, um, is taking care of that? Or, you know, I'm just not sure. It, it just seems to me that, um, you know, we it just it sounds like there there could be a double standard, and I know that's not what the intention is, but I just kind of I just want to make sure that we're thinking about that um, because the there are similar issues with Paseos in other parts of the downtown, I guess, and um, other developments that are happening that are um, market uh, developments. Sure. Well, I, I'll say that um, the. That the intent there was actually to help the developer save money in that um, if they're concerned about long-term maintenance costs, having that kind of um, infrastructure in place could actually create lower costs over the long term in terms of maintenance if they're not having to um, deal with you know, vandalism or other issues that could happen when maybe there aren't as many eyes on the Paseo. Um, that was the intent there of, of mentioning that, not to add costs or make it more challenging. It's actually to you know make it more, make it easier <laughs> for them. Um, and so you know, but that was just thrown out as an idea. Literally, we haven't had discussions about the design of this Paseo. Um, it is early in the process. I mean, you saw the plan that they provided. That is literally all we've got at this point. Um, and so um, you know, there haven't been. Um, any real conversations about how that Paseo would be designed. And it looks like Bonnie might want to jump in on. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I, I just wanted to add to that, that re regarding the Paseo, obviously we have a Paseo uh, between our two affordable housing projects, you know, the Metro, um, PAC South and, uh, and PAC North. And there are a variety of grant opportunities for affordable housing that really are more competitive when you include some public elements to them. So we'd be happy to work um, work with Mr. Tooney on you know some of those uh, some of the actual grants that we're applying for for our projects and really be creative on how to move forward, at least with a draft concept plan. Because I think the reality for us in the downtown, we know that we need to plan for these areas, for these paseos. We can't leave them without some public improvements that really look at the environment and lighting and landscaping. Um, so we want to work with, that, with uh, the developer to really address this in a way that's not cost prohibitive. Great. <clears throat> Council member Cummings, do you have another question? Yeah, uh, question slash comment, because I think you all really um, helped me clarify kind of what's before. So, I mean, just thinking about the agenda report that we have, you know, really this is a resolution that's um, establishing this policy to authorize increases in the use by right limits for these two projects, um, which is supportive um, housing developments that comply with the requirements set forward in this in assembly bill 2162 and so it seems like based on our conversation that you know the the ultimately the final design of this project hasn't been determined nor has it been determined from the metro and so by approving this tonight we're really you know providing this opportunity for them to create these two projects under this assembly bill, increase the number of units, and that staff is gonna be working with the developer to try to figure out you know, what's the best design that's gonna work for this area. And it sounds like that's also gonna require working with public safety and public work. So is that a correct assumption of kind of where we're at? Because it seems like we don't really need to get, if that's the case, we don't need to get to the details around you know, conditions of approval around Hyde or Pase or what have you, because that's gonna be worked on as the design of the building um, gets completed. Correct. We we did include the the conditions for the design under under the policy for the Calvary project just because it was so so early, um, and we wanted to ensure that you know things things were being looked on through the process um, because because it will get a it will be a more streamlined process if if this is approved. Um, so we did include those conditions for that reason, but yeah, essentially there there's definitely still time to work with the applicant uh, through these uh, through these issues. So I guess if that if for example if that's the case, then if the Paseo condition seems to prohibit the project from moving forward, would that mean it would need to come back to council and we need to remove that, or how would we be able to make sure that it it can continue moving forward if that becomes a cost prohibitive? Um, 
just that that condition would be under this policy currently. So if the project were to continue to use the this supportive housing policy, uh, it would have to come back for that condition to be removed um, if, if, if need be. Thank you. Yeah, if I might, it sounds like we've got we've got a little bit of more work to do on the actual project, and this won't be the last time that we see this. Um, was there any questions, more questions for Mr. Tooney before we move to public comment? I think we've answered everything. Mr. Tooney, thanks for joining us tonight, and um, as we deliberate, we may we may have more questions, so. Just hang on if you would till we're all through. Thanks. Okay, I will take it out the public comment now. Uh, I'm showing two people in our queue here who want to comment on the project or on this item, excuse me. Uh, the first uh, person will be with the phone number ending in 4892. And you should be unmuted shortly. Hi there, go ahead. Oh yeah, this is Tim Willoughby speaking for Affordable Housing Now. Uh, and just going to reiterate some of the things in our letter. This is very exciting to see um, these proposals under 2162 taking advantage of that. Uh, it, it, it's a the streamlining process makes these projects more affordable. And if you're doing 100% affordable housing project, that's really important. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was that this is possible, 100% affordable housing project like this is possible because of the Calvary Church. Um, you can build 100% affordable on city land, uh, but otherwise you need uh, someone like the Calvary Church to put up the land to make it affordable. So they should be commended for this very important uh, uh, contribution to making this work for a very important project. So anyway, it sounds like council's all for this. Thank you for moving it forward. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the next person is at the last four digits is 1810. And you're un you should be unmuted shortly. Yeah. This Uh, yeah, this is Gary Phillip. Despite some confusion by proponents that this is an up-down vote on affordable housing, what is before you is the question of whether to greatly enlarge the state's generous 50-unit use by right zoning law. That housing is called supportive housing, but I call it exclusionary housing, not low-cost or affordable housing, because many people are excluded as a permanent requirement. Much is made of AB 2162 allowing this under certain conditions, but not so much why AB 2162 can also disallow this. There's a city size limit of 200,000 and homeless census max limit of 1,500, which seem to be very dull deciders considering the city size and homeless count can vary by an order of magnitude. Are these limits independent or are they related? More importantly, why are these disqualifier limits there at all? As we know, there are the reasons to have some public housing. AB 2162 doesn't convey its thinking, but that reasoning is the same as the answer to the question before you. Logically, I speculate the reasoning was that for small cities that have too many homeless or poor people on assistance, dense use by right welfare projects should be disallowed because it would turn the city into an excessive automatic permanent dense cesspool future slum of government dependent zoning relaxation relative to its size. 200,000 and 1,500 are somewhat arbitrary numbers. Suppose it was 100,000 and 750, the same ratio. This city would not qualify. Are there really only 1,200 homeless in Santa Cruz? You can't be sure. Skid Row in LA isn't there by random chance. It's where the affordable ghetto plexes and homeless services are. Santa Cruz is pretty much exactly the kind of city AB 2162 intended to exclude from outside UBR permanent welfare housing. Outside welfare money, economy of the poor. Permanent UBR higher density than even asked for subsidized housing approval is before you. 
at a minimum, 1.9% of the population. There's little doubt Santa Cruz City already has county dump honors for the homeless, and also a uh, little doubt it already shoulders more than its county share. The reasons are examined, but I suspect it is because services for the poor, the homeless, the cottage and nonprofit industries are codependent on servicing them and have a proliferating alliance with a pro-government dependency sit run the city government only just here. Thanks. Bye. Uh, the next caller has uh, phone number ending in 2527. You'll be unmuted shortly. You should be able to... You may need to... Oh, there Hi. you are. Mayor, can Hi. you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Phil Boutel, and I want to just wanted to call out uh, thanks to Councilmember Watkins, who highlighted the kind of the future vision for downtown, which is a, a walkable neighborhood where we provided enough amenities that people maybe don't need to own as many cars as they do living in our uh, our distant neighborhoods where there's just houses. Um, so I, I'm glad you brought that into the conversation about parking. Um, and just in general, I encourage council to consider at this level approving a higher level of units, uh, perhaps the 100 or somewhere somewhere around there, to give the applicant more flexibility so that uh, should they need that, uh, we don't lose the, uh, the amenities that would come with it, such as the Paseo or, or other things. I think whether it's 75 or 100, I think this is going to be a great project, and I encourage you to uh, just give them that flexibility early on. And if they need to go negotiate with the church later about heights or views, Let's again give the applicant that flexibility so this project can be uh, better for our downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the line that is seeking to comment on the project tonight? I'm seeing no one, so I'm going to turn it back to council. Um, I see Councilmember Collentari Johnson. Uh, I'll recognize you. So we're going to be deliberating and um, and uh, coming to final decision. Yeah, go ahead, Shabra. Great, thank you. Um, thank you again for for staff for reading this before us and for Mr. Tooney. Um, and thank you, Mr. Willoughby, for pointing out um, the credit due to Calvary Church for their role in making this um, project a, a possibility. Um, I'm really excited that this is gonna be one of the first um, agenda items that I get to vote on, 100% affordable housing in our downtown, um, creating a, a culture of walkable communities. Um, you know, I, I, I hear and understand the concerns of um, the applicants, um, and I think uh, there's some great ideas by staff, and I think we can really work together to um, find a way that the, this, this condition around the Paseo um, will not be a burden on the applicant. Um, I also think it, it, this is an ideal location, um, and moving it to um, up to 100 units as a, um, as, an, as a, a buffer uh, for us to have some flexibility to explore and, and not, to, not to make it a, a condition of approval, but again, just for us to explore. So I think with that, I, I would like to make a motion um, to approve staff's recommendation with the increase in the maximum number of units on the Cedar Street project from 75 to 100, um, noting that this is an option council encourages uh, the applicant to explore but that it is not a requirement for approval of the project. And also ask that staff work with the applicants on the design for the Paseo um, that's mutually agreeable to the city and the applicant. And if an agreement can't be reached, the applicant may come back uh, to council for further discussion. Thank you, we have a motion on the floor and council member coming, did you, sorry, I couldn't, you want to second it? Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Council Member Collentari Johnson, seconded by Council Member Cummings to um, to increase the limit of um, to 100 units for the Cedar Street project and maintaining the recommend staff recommendation for the 
for the uh, uh, PAC South project. Um, I'll just look to see if there's any other comments from council members. I do have a comment I'd like to add in. Council member um, Watkins, I think, did you have a comment on the project again, or I saw your hand up, or were you looking to second? I was looking to second, but I appreciate this direction and the flexibility and option associated with it. And just also, um, you know, just reminding the community and um, those who may be watching about just sort of that holistic picture of our vision for our downtown, downtown and how these projects um, interact with each other. And um, together they kind of fit that puzzle piece to make it all really work for a more affordable and sustainable community. So um, looking forward to hopefully seeing this go through and some more affordable housing in our community. Yeah, and I'll just add in before we um, take the vote this evening that um, I really appreciate the, the um, applicant coming and, and, and Mr. Tooney, thanks for being here tonight. Um, yeah, I think this is a night that many of us sort of imagine may or may not ever come. There was a lot of doubt in our community that we would actually get a project at uh, the location there at, near the Calvary Church. A lot of uh, suspicion that maybe we wouldn't get the Metro projects together. Um, I'm really excited that um, in one night we're doing um, a lot of significant affordable housing um, approvals, um, which I hope sends a message to everyone in our community that we are committed to this and that we are not just talking, but we are actually doing. Um, so I'm very excited um, and I wanna just thank Mr. Tooney for investing your resources in our community and also recognize Calvary Church. Um, I've met with those folks off and on over the last couple of years um, and always uh, suspected that we would have a project coming at some point. So it's exciting to be here tonight. Um, I also, I guess just, um, I didn't speak um, much when we were doing questions, but um, you know, I'm, I'm supportive. I, I, I understand the need to try to maximize our units, but um, I'm also, very aware of the design aspect to our community. And so um, I think we will have a signature project also across the street with the new library um, and providing parking that's gonna be needed in downtown as well as affordable housing um, on that project as well. Um, I think it's really important and I do support actually the, the three-story height um, that Mr. Tooney is uh, proposing in his project. I think, um, you know, we have some, the Calvary Church is a, you know, is a is really a landmark in our community. It's a very, very unique um, piece of architecture. And um, then we have all the wonderful little uh, cottages just directly across the street. And I think scale is really important when we're thinking about um, our downtown. And I, and I really support sort of the, the you know, the variable kinds of, of, of um, outcomes that we can find in this area. So. Um, I just kind of put that out personally, and I do think that the SEO is a real opportunity, um, and I do support that our staff, um, thank you for your motion, Council Member Kaltari Johnson, because I do think that that, um, that direction provides that continuum of trying to uh, create something that is beneficial um, and doable by the applicant. So I just wanted to add those comments tonight. And um, if there's no other comments by council members, I'll go ahead and call for the roll call vote, please. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. So that motion uh, was uh, by uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. It was seconded by Council Member Cummings and the motion passed unanimously. So thank you and thank you Mr. Tooney for being here. And uh, also thank you to our um, uh, staff at Economic Development for your work on continued work on Metro South. Um, and uh, also to our staff at the planning department um, to um, really helping Mr. Tooney bring the project forward as quick as it did. So we appreciate your work, Matt, Lee, our whole team. So you guys are, we're suddenly seeing lots of housing popping up. So thank you. Thanks. Mr. Tooney, good night. Okay, we are on to our final item tonight, which is um, the advisory body appointments and reappointments.
Um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 21 through 31, the advisory body appointments and reappointments. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. I'd like to call on the city clerk to explain the nomination and appointment process. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you will start on a rotating basis with um, a council member who will then state their nomination up to the amount of openings to that particular commission. So for example, if one has two openings, you only need to state up to two nominees. Um, if a council member before you has already stated someone that you were going to, you don't need to name them, they're already considered nominated. And that's it. And then we'll do a roll call vote at the end of each one. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, just a clarification, um, Bonnie or Martine Bernal, if you're available. There was one um, advisory committee which we received only two applicants for, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity C Commission. And committee, excuse me. Um, is the time, what, I, I believe that um, it would be appropriate for us to, to um, potentially look to um, trying to obtain a, some additional applicants for that. And I'm wondering if, um, if a motion is appropriate right now to put that committee, particular committee back out for uh, re-advertisement to, to try to recruit some more applicants. Is, is now the time for that, Bonnie, or should we do that when that um, committee is actually being voted on? Um, you could do that now, but I would recommend um, before we move in to do public comment so that you do public comment on all of them as a whole instead of each one individually. Okay, great. But then you could do you could move into a motion to um, defer. We can um, re-advertise for that particular committee. Okay, great. So we will go ahead and. Um, Take, so we should take public comment now on these on this item, and then um, we'll start council deliberation. Uh, council member Cummings, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a quick question. Thank you for a uh, process. Because um, I know in the past, um, council members for the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, um, individual council members get to make an appointment. And so I'm just kind of curious, mm -hmm. is that, does that? That's still the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, when we get to that, you have we have four openings. We have, um, well, yeah, we'll get to we'll explain that. So we have four appointments to to be made. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and take this item out to public comment. I'm looking at members of the public in our queue, and if you would like to comment on this item which is advisory body appointments and reappointments. Please raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone in the public, so we'll go ahead and move on to um, completing our process and appointing folks this evening. Okay, we, we, oh, go ahead. Mayor, go ahead. I'd like to entertain a motion if you'd like to have um, us go back out to um, seek more applicants for our equal Oppor equal employment opportunity committee. And thank you for for, for noting that. I'm I'm I, I'm showing my uh, my brain starts to turn off at seven o'clock. Um, yes, uh, please. Thank you. And uh, Member Kalantari Johnson, did you uh, want to second that motion? Yes, I'm going to second. Okay, great. Thank you. And I will go ahead and take a roll call vote on that. So we have a motion on the floor to uh, defer uh, seating anyone on the e Equal Employment Opportunity Committee at this time and re-advertising for additional applicants for that committee. And I will have a roll call vote. Okay, Council Members Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously.
Okay, we'll move on to um, beginning with the Arts Commission. There is one vacancy with a term expiration of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nominations starting with Council Member Golder. And uh, recall, if, if you're count, and as we work through everybody, if, if the person your nominee was, you don't need to renominate them. Council Member Golder? Okay, I'm going to uh, nominate Judy Gunstra. Okay. Vice Mayor Bruner? I nominate Bridget Lyons. Okay. Let me look at my notes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I too, um, excuse me, uh, my, my nominee has been named. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Difficult, difficult. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'd like to nominate Chris Carr, Christopher Carr. Council Member Brown. I'm set. Thanks. Council Member Colintari Johnson. Yeah, my nominee's been named as well. And Council Member Watkins. Same. Okay, great. Bonnie, will you lead us through this, this process? Okay, good. <laughs> so we have three nominees. We have Christopher Carr, Judy Gunstra, and Bridget Lyons. So I'll just go through and do a roll call vote um, on, the, on the nominees. Okay, great. So for okay. Christopher Carr, um, oh, sorry. sorry You're going to do the roll call. Got it. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins. Because it's always so hard. Um, yes, I'll I'll go ahead and, and go with Carr. Calentari Johnson. No. You can say who you are voted for. Okay, um, Bridget Lyons. Brown. Uh, Judy Grunstra. Cummings. Sorry. Holder. Um, Judy Gunstra, but I just, I never got to say this, but I just wanted to say how amazed I was with everyone's application and like, it, it like warmed my heart just seeing so many people wanting to be part of our community. I know this isn't the place to say it, but I just, thank you everybody. Thank you. I hope you stay involved. Even if you don't make it onto one of these commissions, we need you. We love you and we appreciate you. Um, on that note, really quick, we do hang on to application for two years, so. Even if they don't make it this go around, we'll contact them. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, Bridget Lyons. And Mayor Myers. Uh, Bridget Lyons. Okay, Bridget Lyons is appointed. Okay. Great. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Lyons, and welcome to the Arts Commission. Next up, we have the Board of Building, Building and Fire Appeals. There are two possible appointments and or reappointments, both with term expirations of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nominations starting with Vice Mayor Bruner. I nominate Peter Bagnell and Miles Corcoran. Next up is my nomination. Mine have been um, covered. Uh, Council Member Cummings. I'm good. Council Member Brown. That might have been covered too, thanks. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Covered. Council Member Watkins? The same. Council Member Golder? I'm good. Roll call? As we don't need to do a vote. If we could do it by consensus, everybody has the okay. same nominees. Okay. We have a unanimous consensus to reappoint Peter Bagnall and Miles Corcoran to the Board of Building and Fire Appeals. Thank you for serving and uh, Welcome back to the uh, 
Board of Building and Fire Appeals. Um, okay, next up we have the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. There was one vacancy and three possible appointments and or reappointments. Council members Brown, Calentari Johnson and Watkins and Vice Mayor Bruner all have nominations. The term for each appointed commissioner would be the same as the nominating council member. May I please have nominations starting with council member Brown. Ann Simonton. And council member Kalantari Johnson. Roya Paksa. Council member Watkins. Um, Delphine Burns. And Vice Mayor Bruner. I am deferring my uh, nomination to the next council meeting. Okay. Great. Uh, Bonnie, we, that's just a direct appointment, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And we just need um, general consensus that everybody approves those nominations and then. Do we have general consensus, thumbs up? Mm -hmm. Welcome, uh, council, uh, Member uh, Simonton, uh, Roya, Paksa, and Delphine um, to the Commission for Prevention of Violence Against Women. Next up is the Downtown Commission. There are two vacancies, both with terms expiring on January 1st, 2025. I will start by nominating. Is that me? <laughs> me, right, Bonnie? I'm, I'm reading this. Yep. Um, uh, Elizabeth Carr. We only have one, yet there are two openings. I'm sorry, Elizabeth Carr and Daniel Nelson. Council member uh, Cummings. Uh, I'm gonna nominate Bubba Rader and Karen Simmons. Council member Brown. I'm set. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Also set. <laughs> Council member Watkins. I'm also set. Okay. Council member Golder. I'm good. And Vice Mayor Bruner. I'm good. Okay. Um, Bonnie, we have four, we have four nominees. Can we go through each one? Okay. I'll go through the council member and then you can tell me who you vote for. Um, you could vote up to, for up to two, and you have Elizabeth Carr, Daniel Nelson, Bub Rader, and Karen Simmons. Councilmember Watkins? Um, Beth Carr and Daniel Nelson. Kalantari Johnson? Elizabeth Carr and Daniel Nelson. Brown? Elizabeth Carr and Karen Simmons. Cummings? Bob Rader, Karen Simmons. Boulder? Uh, Daniel Nelson and Bob Rader. Vice Mayor Bruner? Daniel Nelson and Elizabeth Carr. And Mayor Myers. Elizabeth Carr and Daniel Nelson. So you have Elizabeth Carr and Daniel Nelson. Welcome uh, to the Downtown Commission, Elizabeth Carr and Daniel Nelson. Thank you for serving. Uh, next up we have the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee, which has been deferred Part by motion. Next is the Historic Preservation Commission. There are two possible appointments and or reappointments, both with term expirations of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nominations starting with Council Member Brown. Ross Eric Gibson and Jessica Coos. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I'm covered. Council Member Watkins. David, oh, I'm gonna, I don't really know how to pronounce his last name. Sub, sub, oh? Sub, I think it's Sub, yeah, yeah. 
And you have another? That person has been named already. Okay. Council member Golder. I'm good. Vice Mayor Bruner. I'm good. I'll nominate uh, Subak, Subak and Kuntz and council member Cumming. I'm good. Okay. Bonnie, can we do a roll call vote? Council member Watkins. Jessica and David. Helen Tari Johnson. Um, Gibson and Coop. Brown. Gibson and Goose. Cummings. Gibson and Goose. Holder. Uh, Coos and Subak. Vice Mayor Bruner. Jessica Coos and David Subak. And Mayor Myers. Jessica Coos and David Subak. So it's Jessica Coos and David Subak. Okay. Welcome to the commission, Jessica and David, and thank you for serving. Uh, the next uh, appointment is for the Parks and Recreation Commission. There are two possible appointments or and or reappointments, both with term expirations of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nominations starting with Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Yes, I'd like to um, nominate Christina Kincaid Glavis and Holly Locatelli. Council Member Watkins. I have no new nominees to add. Council Member Golder. I'm good. Vice Mayor uh, Bruner. I'm good. I will note, I, I'm good also. Council Member Cummings. Good. And Council Member Brown. I'm good. Okay, I think we have uh, consent on that one. Consensus, excuse me. Uh, welcome back, uh, Holly Locutelli and Christina uh, Kingley Glavis to the uh, Parks and Rec Commission. Thank you for your service. Next, we have the Planning Commission. There is one possible appointment and or reappointment with a term expiration of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nominations starting with Council Member Watkins. I'd like to nominate Julie Conway. Council Member Golder. I'm good. Vice Mayor Bruner. I'm good. I'm good with my nomination. Council Member Cummings. Good. Council Member Brown. Same. And Council Member Colantari Johnson. I'm set. I believe we have unanimous consensus again. Welcome back. Uh, Commissioner Conway to the Planning Commission. Thank you for your service. Next up is the Sister Cities Committee. There are two possible appointments and or reappointments, both with term expirations of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nominations starting with Council Member Golder. Um, I'm gonna nominate Laura and Douglas. Okay. That is Laura Caravello and Douglas Hull, just for public folks. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. I'm set. And I am also set. Council Member Cummings? Yes. Council Member Brown? I'm set. Council Member Colantari Johnson? I'm set. Council Member Watkins? Me too. Okay, by unanimous consensus. Um, Welcome Laura Caravallo to the Sister Cities Committee and uh, congratulations, Doug, on your reappointment. Thank you for your service. Next is the Transportation and Public Works Commission. There are three possible appointments and or reappointments, all with term expiration 
of January 1st, 2025. May I please have nomination starting with Vice Mayor Bruner. Can you repeat that please? There are three possible appointments and or reappointments, all with terms expirations of January 1st, 2025. This is for the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Your nominee. Thank you. I nominate Kyle Kelly, Robert Orizzi, and Samantha Vrooman. Okay. And I am covered. Council Member Cummings. Um, I'd like to add Sean Orgel Olson and Sabrina Lopez. Okay. Council Member Brown. I'm covered. Council Member Collintari Johnson. I'm set, thank you. Council Member Watkins. I too am covered, thank you. And Council Member Golder. I'm covered too. Okay. And we have a roll call vote, Bonnie. So your votes are for either Kyle Kelly, Sabrina Lopez, Sean Orgel Olson, um, Robert Orizzi, or Samantha Berman. Council Member Watkins. Robert um, Orizzi, Samantha Berman, and Kyle Kelly. Kalantari Johnson. Kyle Kelly, Robert Orizzi, and Samantha Berman. Brown. Uh, Sean Orgel Olson, Sabrina Lopez, and Robert Orizzi. Coming. Lopez, Orgel Olson, and Orizzi. Older. Samantha Bruman, Robert Arisi, and Kyle Kelly. Vice Mayor Bruner. Robert Arisi, Samantha Bruman, and Kyle Kelly. And Mayor Myers. Kyle Kelly, Samantha Bruman, and Robert Arisi. Okay, you have um, Kyle Kelly, Robert Orizzi, and Samantha Berman. Congratulations, Kyle Kelly, Samantha Berman, and Robert Orizzi. Uh, Robert, um, thank you again for your service on this commission and um, welcome to the other two new members. Thanks for your service, everybody. The last is the Water Commission. There is one county elector vacancy and one city elector appointment or reappointment, both with terms of expiration of January 1st, 2025. Um, I will start Mayor, by nom I'm sorry. Sorry, really quick. Um, the, your script isn't split up, but we need to split it up by the county position and the city position. So the county position has okay. Tom Burns or Krista Myers. Okay. So I'll do um, the city, um, the city one first, and then the other. Sure, either way. Or do I do them together? What's what's the best? Well, you, you would need to split them separately. Okay. You can start with the city one. That's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I will start by nominating um, Justin Burks. Council Member Cummings. I'm okay. Council Member Brown. I'm okay. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I'm set. Council Member Watkins. The same. Council Member Golder. I'm gonna nominate Jim Mecca. And Council Member, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner. I nominate, oh, same. I'm set. You're set. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, we uh, will need a roll call vote. So you have one, this is for the city spot for Justin Burks or James Meckes. Council Member Watkins? Burks? Kalantari Johnson? Burks? Brown? 
Zemeckis. Cummings? Birch. Boulder? Zemeckis? Vice Mayor Bruner? James Meckis. And Mayor Myers? Burks. It's Justin Burks. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Burks, to the Water Commission. Thank you for your service. Okay, we will now move on to the um, County Elector vacancy for the Water Commission. We have two nominees or two applicants, Tom Burns and Krista Myers. Um, and I will start by nominating Tom Burns. Council Member Cummings? I'll nominate Krista Myers. Council Member Brown? I'm set. We don't have to go through. Both people have been nominated. We could just go right to the vote. Oh, we can. You're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm so used to having more than two. <laughs> Thank you for being my brain after 7 o'clock. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bonnie. Uh -huh. Councilmember Watkins. Burns. Calentari Johnson. Tom Burns. Brown. Burns. Cummings. Myers. Golder. Tom Burns. Vice Mayor Bruner. Tom Burns. And Mayor Myers. Uh, Burns. Tom Burns. Okay. Welcome, Tom, to the Water Commission. Thank you for your service. That concludes item number 31 on our agenda. We'll now move to oral communications. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. You, we request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Please remember, this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. And again, I just wanna restate, this is for items not on our agenda this evening. And I see currently two members in the public uh, with their hands raised, so I'll start with, uh, uh, Mr. Phillips, ending in 18110. Yeah, while the justice warriors ignore the American just principle of equal opportunity, they work on instituting their smell test failed doctrine called equity, assuming everyone is entitled to an equal life outcome. The supposed justification is concentrated in just a few group identity statistics, which do not prove causation, and they ignore there are millions of reasons why people's lives differ. As a personal example, consider my two-year-old brother and I were raised by the same parents in the same cities, schools, by largely the same teachers, share the same values, the same personalities, and yes, had equal opportunity. One of us graduated third in high school class of 450, became a semiconductor engineer for 30 years, retired debt-free comfortably at 52. The other ran away from huge lifelong debt, disappeared, dropped out of society, last known living somewhere off the grid as an aging ranch handyman in the Yola Bola wilderness playing Jack as saxophone to the squirrels. It's not an injustice. Think harder about that equity weak leg of the three-legged 
stool of SE's pillars of community. The KGB could not have done a better job of demoralizing the American public into victimhood, selling out individual freedom for an authoritarian, ever bigger intrusive government, but it was mostly done from within. What rightfully used to be an apolitical government-run educational system but was destroyed by partisan un-American political ideology and converted into a leftist children's indoctrination boot camp. So busting the equity myth must be a lot like your parents finally telling you Santa Claus isn't real. Okay, then, the leftist concept of equity isn't real fairness, isn't real justice, isn't really more virtuous than Antifa calling itself anti-fascist or the anti-racists really pretending they aren't now the racists of today. I've got three new-to-you pillars of community for your consideration. Try mutual respect for everyone's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, But which, by the way, pursuit means the act of striving to gain or accomplish something, not the granting of government privilege, treating different people unequally, to try to make their life outcomes identical. Thanks. And our next uh, caller is with the phone number ending in 1705. You're welcome to address us. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. This is Eric Grodberg. I'm going to read a few short quotes from a city document. Um, Santa Cruz has one of the highest per capita po populations of homeless individuals in the state of California and therefore in the United States. Unsheltered individuals living in encampments are present within the city's limits at much higher rates than are present within neighboring jurisdictions. Second quotation, same document. Unlike some larger cities within the state, the city of Santa Cruz generally does not receive significant funding from the state or federal government to provide housing or other services to persons experiencing homelessness. Instead, the county of Santa Cruz receives significant funding to provide these services and has been legally tasked with providing these services. This document is a recent um, legal filing in federal court that the city submitted. I submit to you as a council that if you can make this argument forcefully in federal court, and there are other similar quotations in this document, I would like you to stop playing nice with the county and play hardball and get them to live up to their legal obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other callers on the line tonight that would like to address the council? during oral communication. I'm not seeing any. So we will go ahead and adjourn our meeting for this evening. I do wanna um, just comment at the end of tonight. Uh, I hope everyone in the mountains stay safe over the next few days. Um, and uh, please know everybody here in Santa Cruz City is thinking about you all um, and we will help with whatever happens over the next three to four days and uh, please stay safe. So good night everybody, thank you for a great meeting and uh, now I can go rest my head. Good night everybody, cheers. Goodbye.